Okay, so good morning, Belgium. How are we doing? All right, so are you ready to read some YAML today? I, I don't think you guys have got a choice, actually. So, so. Yeah, so <laughs> thanks a lot for coming over. My name is Alberto Rios, and I'm a software engineer in Pivotal. My name's Ollie Hughes. I'm also a software engineer at Pivotal. Um, so I've been focusing a lot of my time in the past six months on finding uh, ways to improve the experience for developers using uh, Kubernetes. Um, and actually been a user of Kubernetes myself for about two years now. Yeah, so Ollie and I have been working together over the past couple of years uh, building developer tools for a platform as a service called Cloud Foundry. And yet recently we started to take a look at the Kubernetes world, just thinking how can we actually port our services there, or did they make any sense at all, right? So that's how we, you know, we have been doing a lot of learning over the past few months, and we want to share all that with you, all the things we have learned. Sure. I think um, back when we were sort of writing the um, proposal for, the, for this talk, a big motivation really was um, we kind of felt that the getting started experience for developers um, starting out using Kubernetes are really could be improved a lot. Um, and the problem, it really isn't about a lack of information. It's actually kind of um, finding the right information that's sort of pertinent to, to you as a developer. Um, I mean, the Kubernetes project itself, it's really got a very extensive document, documentation set. But when you read through it, a lot of this stuff really is about, um, kind of feels like it's geared towards operators um, who are sort of managing um, their clusters and productions and things. Um, I think the other thing as well, there's usually sort of a myriad of ways of doing uh, things in Kubernetes. So we kind of really wanted to sort of show you um, a curated set of tools and approaches that we've sort of found sort of um, recently and over time, and we kind of feel is a, um, you know, a, a, a good kind of path to follow. Um, really. So um, I guess to describe what we're going to do, like a whistle stop tour of the uh, Kubernetes ecosystem and just kind of diving a bit deeper into just into those areas um, that we, we feel are worth understanding in some depth and um, really kind of helping you kind of get to production, get your workloads into production in the best way possible. Yeah, and also please ask questions. Like we're going to be making a few stops just for questions uh, because we don't want you to hold them until the end. Right? It's going to be three hours almost, so please ask them. Okay, so as we were developing this talk, um, it kind of felt like a journey, really. So a journey of discovery, I suppose, kind of explaining new concepts along the way um, and kind of building that knowledge uh, as we go along. Um, and it kind of also fell into, fell into natural sections. So, um, and it reminded me a bit of uh, Sid Meier's Civilization, the game I think some of you probably would have played. So, and the kind of eras. So we kind of started off with the ancient era, going all the way into like space and things. So um, it kind of felt like a useful way of sort of dividing up the talk. And it's a three hour talk, so there will be a half hour break. Um, so, but two and a half hours, it's uh, quite a long time to pay attention to There's some very sort of technical information. So I think by dividing up the content, it kind of hopefully gives you a chance to kind of ahead of time decide on the bits that you want to maybe engage your brain a little bit more with. Um, and then maybe there's some areas that you maybe already kind of feel I know a little bit about or maybe they're less relevant. So just to kind of give you that, um, yeah, that warning really. So. So, okay, to begin with, let's talk a little bit about um, sort of why Kubernetes and, and maybe sort of some of the reasons that um, your team might consider adopting Kubernetes um, as a technology. So there is a whole lot of marketing hype around Kubernetes you've probably seen already um, and a massive kind of um, big, you know, traction from all sorts of commercial vendors and things. So hopefully we can cut through some of all the marketing stuff and give you a balanced view from a developer's perspective on um, what uh, kind of things are, um, you know, would be a good reason for you to adopt Kubernetes. Yeah, so when you see a platform as a service, uh, the point to production is just one CLI command away, right? So all the complexity is hidden from us, and if we are willing to structure our application in a specific way. So in Cloud Foundry, you have CF Push, and Google App Engine Standard Environment, the Cloud App Deploy, same thing for Heroku, right? Yeah, so um, I agree. So yeah, I've been definitely for coming from sort of a platform as a service, like Cloud Foundry or Heroku. Um, so Kubernetes is uh, sort of going to feel quite different. Um, I think one thing that's very different for me is the kind of thing, the notion of porcelain and the plumbing. So I think that separation in platform and service is often quite clear. But with Kubernetes, I think it, the, the lines um, between porcelain and plumbing are, are, are quite a bit more blurred. Um, 
So I think maybe some of you have not used platform as a service, and maybe instead you've uh, used things like sort of Docker Compose, um, perhaps sort of on a cloud instance, and using sort of things like a configuration management tool to start up a cloud cloud instance using Ansible maybe and uh, running Docker. So I think if you're if that's your experience, you may find. Um, the stuff to, you're going to learn about Kubernetes a bit more, um, like stuff that you're used to, the way it kind of allows you to um, uh, do a lot of configuration. Um, so I think you might feel, feel comfortable and actually quite um, pleased with what uh, Kubernetes offers for you. Yeah, so in the Kubernetes world, we have more control, but our feeling is feeling is going away, right? So for each step to take our application to production, we have a really nice set of different tools, right? So it will be much easier to swap out a component, but we have a much, much harder learning curve, right? So there is a new tool every couple of days, and if we keep this growth, we're going to have as many tools as JavaScript Spring was out there. So watch out, right? So because of that, we're going to be showing the ones that we found more useful. Um, but before we get there, some things you're not going to see or you're not going to cover are uh, how to operate or deploy a cluster, really. And we're not going to do any live demos because we're not brave enough, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah, I think um, it's, this is the first time we've done this talk, and maybe if we get invited back to the talk, we'll do live demo next time. But I think we just wanted to, and you know, there's so many moving parts. We thought maybe a season. Yeah, just, and uh, also, uh, yeah, and this is very boring to see because a lot of things take time. It gets really boring after a while. So we just said, you know, we're just going to explain what we need to get our job done, right? And this may be the most important slide in our presentation. Uh, here you will find all the examples we're going to show with all the steps to reproduce them. Uh, we created two repos, we got two ways to do things, and this is something that you will see along the presentation, right? We couldn't even agree on the repo name, you take a look at that, right? So we have different opinions, and we are going to expose them uh, along the talk, right? Sure, so um, I think uh, in the develop, developer community, the, um, there's probably um, a fair amount of healthy skepticism about Kubernetes. I know personally, um, when I first started out with Kubernetes, my um, initial reaction for quite a while was like, oh, you know, we don't need this. This is so much complexity. It's just why are we introducing um, all of this uh, into our kind of simple uh, kind of workflow? We're kind of you know, adding in a load of stuff maybe we don't need. Um, and I think g given the huge amount of um, hype and corporate push behind Kubernetes, it's actually quite healthy that we as developers are sort of asking difficult questions um, about whether the sort of our team or company would actually sort of benefit from Kubernetes. Um, and I think that actually these biases really do have some validity. Um, so Kubernetes is a really quite a comprehensive system. Um, it provides you with all the building blocks really for building a distributed system in the cloud. Um, but where I do disagree um, is that the, the statement of Kubernetes being a complicated system where, in fact, it's distributed systems that are inherently complex, um, and things like automated scaling and high availability, uh, leader, leader election, they're all sort of fraught with um, difficulties and challenge, challenges and lots of ways that you can make a mistake. So really, um, a goal of Kubernetes is um, not to make your systems more complicated, but actually reduce that complexity that you encounter when you want to build a highly available system. Um, and really, the way that um, Kubernetes does this is by providing a set of common patterns um, for, for running these um, kind of workloads in a fault-tolerant and scalable way. So uh, I don't know if you, many of you have seen the uh, movie Office Space. Um, it's, if you haven't, it's a, really a great parody about life as a software engineer in the uh, corporate world. Um, when I was sort of thinking about um, how to sort of describe what I had in my mind, uh, sort of big Bill Lumberg from Office Space uh, sprung to mind when um, sort of thinking about the sort of things called the illities in uh, software design. So really, because he's wearing um, belt and braces, so he never wants to be uh, caught with his pants down. Um, so if you've never heard of the term illities in system design, it describes sort of the non-functional requirements of a system. Um, so in other words, the things that you really don't want to get wrong, because usually it risks that you're going to lose a lot of money and damage your reputation. Um, and also, this is the sort of thing that us as developers were often summoned, summoned to very long meetings with architects to debate in depth about sort of various strategies, how to meet availability requirements and so forth. Um, so I think um, these days, most applications that we run in production have to meet um, service level objectives for um, all sorts of things like uh, um, scalability, um, uh, availability, and the new kid on the block really is observability that you sort of hear quite a lot these days. 
Um, and I think as developers, most of us don't want to spend all of our time implementing these kind of features that our sort of users and customers don't gain direct value from. Um, and this is one of the big advantages of adopting Kubernetes that it gives us the tools to build kind of systems that meet these non-functional requirements. We don't have to reinvent the wheel ourselves. Um, so I think if sort of things like zero downtime upgrades, automatic failover, um, and system monitoring are really important to you, then Kubernetes is worth some serious consideration. So I think um, Mark Zuckerberg got it right um, when he allegedly claimed we don't crash ever. Well, at least that's what Jesse Eisenberg said when he uh, portrayed Zuckerberg in the 20, um, 2010 film, The Social Network. Um, so the statement really is quite ironic now, given that Facebook have had a few high-profile outages um, in recent times. Um, but really, I think the point I'm trying to make is that now consumers have such high expectations about availability and performance. Um, so the minute there's a sniff of downtime in your service, your app, generally everyone's going to be tweeting about it. They're going to be very frustrated. They're going to be complaining. So um, the game has changed, basically, and downtime and sort of slow response, it's just becoming much more sort of costly and embarrassing for organisations um, than it ever was in the past, really. Okay, so um, moving on to sort of the next section of the talk, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the theory behind sort of Kubernetes, um, and I felt it was important to cover some of these topics that are um, sort of fairly superficial level before diving into practical examples, just because I think it will help us with the learning process. Excuse me a second. So, if I was in an elevator, I asked myself, could I explain Kubernetes to someone? Um, and I thought, maybe if it's the Empire State Building and I'm stopping at every floor, it's possible. But I'm going to try it anyway. Um, so, Okay, Kubernetes, it's open source software, um, it, and it or orchestrates the uh, processes needed to um, successfully run highly available um, distributed systems in the cloud. Um, actually, sorry, I'm going to skip this. I've got the wrong slide there, sorry. Um, <laughs> so um, w when we talk about these workloads, um, we usually refer to um, a process running inside of a container. Um, but actually, in fact, these days, Kubernetes um, also supports virtual machine-based workloads. Um, and it's actually responsible for all aspects of a container's lifecycle, from pulling an image um, from a registry, starting and stopping a process, um, executing hooks or populating environment variables. Um, and a workload itself, uh, it can be stateful um, and expect storage to persist across restarts and also be available to that workload um, anywhere in the cluster. Um, there's also stateless workloads, um, which is something that runs in a very isolated fashion. It doesn't um, expect data to be persisted. And ideally, stateless workloads are, are the thing that you kind of usually want because that's a lot more simpler to deploy. Um, and the other way um, you can deploy a workload um, is actually as a long-running sort of job, like a cron job. Um, Another big sort of part of what Kubernetes does for us is um, set up networking for us. So things like um, allowing um, our apps to be discoverable, discoverable via DNS um, and also kind of allowing traffic to be available to our workloads from outside on the internet and outside the network. Um, and another big part of, um, of what we're getting is the sort of man uh, management of authentication and authorization for sort of our workloads and sort of network policies allowing um, rules on which how apps can communicate with each other or who can access them. Um, so the other, for me, the other, so we, we kind of talked a bit about orchestration, but the other big part um, for me is about what Kubernetes does. It's about um, declaration. Um, so it's a declarative um, system. There's a, the, the nature of Kubernetes is that um, you, you, you kind of can declare what you want to be orchestrated, um, and that's how we describe um, how our workloads can be run, run in a consistent way across multiple platforms. Um, and I think the most helpful mental model that um, I've found to understand kind of how Kubernetes works is um, it's like an operating system for the cloud where there's sort of a common set of uh, interfaces, um, a common set of abstractions that you um, use this common way of declaring what you want and there's a common set of interfaces that get implemented and then you're harnessing this kind of underlying uh, cloud infrastructure in a portable way without needing to know all these kind of intrinsic details of how your sort of workloads are actually executed in reality. Um, okay, so a little bit about architecture. I'm not going to kind of go into too much depth, but I just really wanted to kind of um, sort of give a broad overview, really. Um, so 
I think um, the important thing really, I think, is this diagram was the, probably the best thing I saw. It's actually on Wikipedia and it, um, for me, kind of really gave um, a, a quite a simple um, high level sort of view of what um, kind of Kubernetes looks like. Um, so within any cluster in Kubernetes, you're always going to have at least one master um, and at least one node. And, but that can be a single machine, and that is the case with um, if you ever come across Minikube, so that Minikube will have both roles um, on the single machine. Um, and actually, most of the components that you find within Kubernetes are actually um, containers themselves within the cluster. Um, and this is a really uh, great thing because it means that um, all of the Kubernetes components itself benefit from the same sort of reliability and scalability traits that your own workloads do. Um, I think when I first sort of figured this out and learnt this, it kind of felt a little bit to me like, um, you know, compiling the first C compiler or something and how that maybe is written in C, and then I stopped thinking because my brain started hurting at that point. So, <laughs> But the, uh, the, the, there are some components in Kubernetes that are not containers, so things like the container runtime itself isn't a container. Um, and that's, that used to be Docker um, as a rule, but now um, you can use that in a pluggable way, and there's other kinds of runtimes that you can use for Kubernetes. So I think the um, most important bit to understand a little bit about Kubernetes architecture, it's the API server, um, as it's central to sort of all aspects of managing um, the cluster's components. Um, and actually, it, um, developers and components never ever sort of talk to another component. You always talk to the API server, so it's always mediating any kind of sort of communication. Um, and kind of what, Another term you hear an awful lot um, is something called a control plane. And collectively, this is the API server, control manager, um, scheduler, and ETCD. So the control plane as a whole, it's like the um, brain of the cluster. Um, and it can make kind of global decisions that affect every, every component. Um, and what a main, the main thing that a control plane does is actually with persisting the requests that you make to the API. And you have this thing called ETCD, which um, stores those requests. Um, and it allows other sort of parts of the uh, cluster to um, kind of watch for those requests and um, act on them. Um, and I think for developers, one of the sorry, let's have a drink. So um, one of the main kind of things that we interact with um, is a pod, and a pod is the um, smallest logical unit of deployment in Kubernetes. Um, so probably the easiest way of um, thinking of what a pod is, it's uh, basically like a sort of a Docker container um, running with it, including its configuration and environment variables and volumes and so forth. But we're going to talk a bit more about pods later on in this talk. Um, so the uh, sort of node itself in Kubernetes is, um, can be a physical or virtual machine. Um, and this is where the, your actual sort of uh, workloads themselves are executed. Um, and there's a scheduling component um, that uses an algorithm to actually decide sort of which node to um, run that workload on. And that's, um, it decides that using um, kind of various metrics, such as how much resource is being used, or even something similar like a round robin. Uh, it, it's, it's quite flexible how you, you can set that up. Um, and one of the most important um, components as a whole in Kubernetes is um, something called kubelet. Um, the job of kubelet is just really to kind of make sure your containers are created and they're up and running. And for me, it feels quite similar to how something like system D or supervisor or something like that works. So it's really that you're giving a, a description um, of what you want to run and it will make sure that, um, that the, the process and that configuration um, is there, the containers started and it will keep watching them to make sure that they um, uh, keep running. Um, and this process, um, actually runs on every node on the cluster. And in Kubernetes sort of terms, we call this a daemon set of something that runs um, on every node. Um, finally, the sort of last bit of architecture for now, I promise. Um, Kube proxy, um, it's basically uh, there to ensure that your networking um, is in place. So whenever you create something called a service in Kubernetes, um, uh, Kube proxy will sit there and it will watch um, for uh, it will basically create the network routes that um, that service requires and allow network traffic um, either internally or from the outside world um, to be available to your um, workload. Um, so one of the um, key sort of logical building blocks you'll use um, as a developer in Kubernetes um, is going to be uh, objects and resources. 
Um, this is kind of the language, in a way, you use to describe how your workload will run. Um, and really, when you're going to sort of set up your deployment for your application, it's the kind of first thing you need to think about what kind of um, resource am I going to need. Um, and an object itself um, is actually it's like an instance of a resource, so it's pretty conceptually similar to like a, an instance of a class in um, Java. Um, and so in this case, uh, we're looking at like a, an ingress object. So you can see in the slide, you've got like um, you're giving it like a version, you're giving it a um, what kind it is, and you're, you're saying um, this is actual the group it belongs to, and and. When you um, sort of declare that, Kubernetes is going to store that information and then go off and create the thing you've asked for. So, um, so the resort in this case, if I could go to the next slide, you'll see the resource itself um, is just like a. Um, it, it basically, you can say in this example here, we've got like deployment. So that URI there would show you all the um, kind of deployments that you've um, got in a system. So. Um, it's a little, I mean, it's a little bit abstract until we actually sort of see some concrete details. It's just kind of one of those things that's just worth sort of understanding um, a little bit about. So, um, okay, we're going to actually finally get onto some sort of real world um, kind of doing stuff. So, yeah, so let's get uh, doing more practical now. So, cool. yeah. so um, yeah, hopefully um, you, you've got a little, at least a little bit kind of excited about um, what Kubernetes can kind of do for you and um, give you a new way maybe of running your, your apps. But um, I think before you're going to do that, I think the first most important bit is um, let's look at how to sort of build an image. Um, and this is probably one of those things that's so easy uh, to do, but it's actually quite a lot of way that, ways that you can um, make mistakes. So we just wanted to cover, cover it in a way that's um, going to make sure that it's ready for production and um, avoid any kind of common mistakes, really. Yeah, so we are going to be telling now the story of a tiny Hello World application who wanted to be production ready. Right? So for that, we're going to start from the second happiest places on the internet, and we want to take it to the first one, which is production. So remember, start for the spring, the .io. And yeah, I, think, I think for me, actually, start.spring.io is one of the happiest places on the internet, because it means I could um, experiment with um, features. And if you haven't used it before, start.spring.io is um, an online service that you can use to bootstrap an application with kind of a curated set of dependencies. And it's actually really ideal when you're playing around with things like Kubernetes, because you can get like a web app up really quickly, um, and you can just deploy something. So that's why we're kind of, um, sort of using it here. So. Um, so, and this is a Java conference, and um, I'm sure that most of you will have um, some opinion about um, Spring Boot, but I think regardless of your Spring user or not, it does remain sort of one of the most popular um, and efficient ways of building cloud-native applications. Um, so just wanted to kind of talk, talk a little bit about that as is what we're going to be using in our examples. Um, and what kind of makes good, um, Boot good for this is that it's really well suited for containerization um, because it all comes as a sort of embedded self-contained um, Web, web server, so you don't have to worry about kind of those other sort of dependencies that you might have done in the past. Um, and actually, um, the uh, performance has been um, improved really quite a lot for startup time, especially um, uh, in boot 2.1 and 2.2. So folks like Dave Sy have done um, amazing work, um, kind of really optimizing that startup. And it's so important for containers as well, because you do want to be able to push a container and have um, your image sort of start up quickly. So. Um, um, the other areas where um, Boot's got great support is things like um, the kind of Kubernetes configuration patterns that you see, like um, getting configuration um, from environment variables and um, from config maps and things, which we'll cover later. Um, but this supports even getting even better in 2.3, which unfortunately I can't give any details about just yet, but sort of watch this space. Yeah, so now that we have an app, uh, we ha you know, let's see what can we do with it, right? We need to put it somewhere, and the entry the ticket to Kubernetes is a container. Right, so let's see what that container actually is a bit. Yeah, so just um, kind of, this might be kind of old news to some of you, some of you but um, I wanted to cover a little bit of the details as it's um, uh, quite an uh, um, important uh, concept and also a good excuse for me to attempt to diagram of a 3D box because I couldn't find a pre-made one. So, <laughs> But essentially what um, containers allow you to do is package your application together um, alongside things like your configuration settings, um, the operating system libraries, uh, sort of application runtimes like the JVM, um, so any third party dependencies. And ultimately what you get out of that, you get a, um, an environment um, that's sort of, uh, sort of self-contained for running your um, uh, application. 
Um, the process of this actual packaging that we kind of see with everything going into the box, um, we call it building an image usually. Um, once you've done this, once you've built this image, you can share it with others um, using an image registry. Um, now I think this has really become sort of the de facto way of distributing sort of server software, especially in sort of open source community. Um, and how containers actually work, um, they use some virtualization, they use virtualization at the kernel level. Um, this is quite similar to how virtual machines work, except instead of being virtual, virtualized at hardware level, they're actually using the sort of, um, sort of Linux kernel-based virtualization. Um, and a container is just like a normal operating system process that is just um, isolated from others. Um, uh, and it shares all the same things like file system and network, but um, it, the container will have its own view of that, which will be different from other containers. Um, and what the great benefit of this is, it means that containers can be loaded much faster than a virtual machine can, and that it uses a lot less resources. Um, this is really, in my opinion, why containerization gained such popular, um, popularity with developers as a whole in the community. And I think um, the other thing to be aware of, um, though, is that uh, the isolation you do get from a container is softer than a VM, so um, it, it brings with it um, possible secur security threats. So, uh, a container process can effectively break out and use um, use the um, operating system's underlying kind of f uh, features. But um, I think out of everything, the one reason why containers are so great is that it lets you um, build an image of something in a way that you know that you can run that across multiple platforms in a consistent way, a known set of dependencies, and hopefully the days of it works on my machine are long behind us and possibly just replaced with a new set of problems instead. But. Yeah, so for that, now that we know the theory, we need to learn how to actually containerize our application, right? Yeah, and I think um, not just how to containerize it, but how to do it in an efficient, secure way, really. I think that's... Um, yeah, so the most common way is through a Docker file. And you just Google around. This is the most basic example you could find on the internet, right? Just in case you haven't seen this before. Uh, you have from, which tells Docker, given uh, an image, which base image you want to use. Copy will copy the files from your local file system to your image directory, work in the, the working directory. Entry point will run it as an executable with some default patterns. And expose is the, po uh, the port in which your application is going to be exposed at, right? So one thing to really bear in mind, you know, because it's super tempting to do a copy dot. Uh, when building an image, especially when you have more than one thing to copy, and that what command is going to copy everything, including your .m files, you know, your secrets or whatever. So it's very easy to get something leaked around that when doing a copy that. So please use a Docker ignore file, which is like a git ignore, but for Docker f uh, files, um, because you know it's super easy to get something done, you know, something leaked away. And with in mind, let's build the first image. So. The first command is going to be to build it, the second to run it, right? Uh, we just say, hey, this is the tag I want you to use, this is the file I want you to use, and you know, the output when you run it locally is what you would expect from any Spring Boot app. Yeah, I think uh, one thing we haven't sort of mentioned um, on the slide, but it's something that you do need to do is make sure that you've got some way um, of building the image, which means you need to uh, install some tools on your machine. Um, so in the past, how I've always, always done it anyway, I've just installed the official um, software from Docker, um, and that runs as a daemon, and you have a command line tool. But actually, there's um, a new set of tools that have come out recently um, that mean you don't need a daemon. Um, so Podman is a one um, sort of set of tools that's come out. So um, that's another one you might sort of be interested uh, in looking at. Yeah, so let's take a look at the container that we just created. So we can see the command we specify, we can see the port, and a random name will be chosen. Oh, well, almost random name, actually, because we go to the, to the code inside Docker where the number, you know, the random name generation happens. And there's one combination that can never co occur, which is, you know, boring and cannot be boring. So, you know. Yeah, sorry, Alberto, I forgot the drum beat sound effect for that one. Yeah. Anyway, so coming back to the image, if we look at it, uh, we see that it is half of a gigabyte, just to say hello world. So a lot of the tools we're going to be taking a look at depend on that image being pushed and pulled on every change we make. So having such a big image is going to impact our development experience. And so let's take a look what can we do to decrease that impact right, in our experience. So for that, the first thing you can do is to use layers. And a .camera image is a series of layers with an instruction inside of them. So what we could do is potentially split our app right, and create a layer for the things that are more likely to change separately. So in our case, that would be our dependencies and our classes, right? So a good practice is to order them from the less frequently changed to the most frequently changed so that the cast can be reused. 
And if we split it in this way, when we change something in one class, the layers above will remain the same, right? So what does that mean? That we just change some you know, code and we didn't touch our dependencies, that layer is going to be untouched, right? So it's going to be much quicker to redeploy. So how do we do this then? So first we have to unpack our jar file. Yeah, I think um, the, re so the reason we're going to actually do this, and normally you wouldn't, obviously, you've got your kind of um, jar that you've been, uh, that's been painstakingly created for, for you uh, by either a Maven plugin or by Spring Boot in this case. So, but the reason we're going to actually unpack it is because um, there's natural layers you can see inside that jar, and they actually change at quite different um, sort of frequencies. So it kind of um, makes sense there to actually, um, instead of deploying a single unit as a layer, to actually have these um, sort of separated out. But um, yeah, make sure, I think if you're going to go down this path, make sure you do sort of all build that into your um, sort of uh, existing build process because you don't want to have some sort of manual kind of intervention here. You want to make sure everything's automated there uh, with um, unpacking it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's see how that looks like. So this is, now we can just copy them, right? You see we have one copy command and that's going to mean you are going to create a new layer. And also we have to change our entry point, right? Because we don't have our fat yet anymore, right? So we have to specify the main class. And if we take a look at the actual results, right, we can see, you know, by looking Docker history, you can check the layers. And one of each, we saw now that we have three layers there, right, one of each uh, with the commands we created above. And the, now if the dependencies don't change, then the leaf layer will not make, you know, will not change. So that's going to make our development process much smoother, right? So however, we still have half of a gigabyte of an image. So let's see what can we do about that, right? So a lot of the things we have in our base image is not necessary. So having a lot of things there is going to increase our cost. It is going to reduce the developer productivity, and it's going to create a larger scope for compliance tools, right? So the more stuff we have in there, the higher the chances for us to encounter a CVE, so a vulnerability in our system, right? And also it's important to notice that uh, we have been using OpenJDK, and we should be using Adopt OpenJDK, right? Because the one from OpenJDK is the, by the Debian team, and it doesn't always match the latest upstream. So we really recommend Adopt OpenJDK instead, right? So we're going to be talking about the two of the most popular distributions, which are uh, Alpine and DistroLess. Uh, DistroLess is the image by Google, so it's the one that they use to put software into production. Uh, the, the image contains a minimal Linux OpenJDK-based run runtime. However, sometimes we want to SSH into a container, but we can't, right? Because no, there's not even a shell over there. And that's an amazing thing from the security perspective, right? Because it reduces the way an attacker can hit our system, right? But let's look at the size. So before we used to have 488 megs, now we have 142, right? But you know, the, the base image is 125 itself, right? So we have reduced, you know, but we can do even smaller if we want to. So let's use Alpine, right? So Alpine is based on muscle C, not on GC lib. So that means that it may lead to some unexpected behavior because we have, you know, the standard C library is different. Yeah, yeah, I think especially, um so I've come across this, if you're working in a kind of a polyglot kind of environment, if you're using maybe microservices with um, something like Python or Node.js, it's um, much more likely for you to encounter problems. I have encountered problems with Java before, and in, in, in specifically that was using the Bouncy Castle encryption library. So uh, I think that the Alpine base image was missing some of the certificates that I had to make sure were copied across. So. Uh, but the point is that these kind of problems, they can be infuriating to fix sometimes. Um, that, that particular one was, I had to talk to all kinds of people. It was a real uh, tricky one to debug. So um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a trade-off, right? I mean, if, you're probably going to be a bit safer. If you can use things like the Debian Slim image, you're actually quite small. Um, so I guess size isn't everything, but yeah. It's yeah, so it also has APK tools installed. So our mm -hmm. attack surface is going to be a little bit uh, bigger than the, with the previous one. But let's look at the actual size, right? So the base image itself is 90 megabytes, right? So our total is going to be 107. So it's even smaller than the previous one. But what do we really want to do, though? Like, we have been pursuing smaller images, but what do we want to achieve? So with Alpine, we'll have smaller images. Uh, with this less, we have a, a smaller at surface attack area. So this is a trade-off you have to make, right? It really depends on the kind of system or what can you afford to do and not yeah. to do with it, right? So there, is a, there are more, this is just a little bit, you know, this is just a small optimization, the two main things that we wanted to cover, but there is way more you can do, right? There are these two guides uh, by Debsire, and they keep updated all the time, so you wanna go into more details, that's, you know, that's a really nice place to go. And also, I think there is another talk happening this week about how to build images, so it should be another place, you know, you wanna learn more? Yeah. 
I think um, this whole size thing is a really uh, interesting one for the whole Java community as well, because this is where you get kind of Go developers so proud that they're getting these 10 megabyte images. So I think um, you know the, uh, we're, we're, it's getting there with Java and things like um, native images and GraalVM are, make, are making it um, better and better. But mm -hmm. um, but I think the key thing is it's not. I mean, it's not just security though. It's um, people want things that are small and fast as well. They want things that they can very very quickly download, and it's just. Yeah so, it's, uh, yeah, so there is a trade-off, really. Sometimes, yeah. like you are using, I don't know, like a native image, then you cannot reuse any layer, right? So yeah. there is always a trade-off you have to make, and this is something you know you can take a look at. All right. So creating a Docker file, you know, for every single project is a bit of a pain. Plus, new version of Docker will contain better improvements, and new good practices will appear, right? So a tool that groups all the good practices mentioned before is Jib. So it is a tool to containerize Java applications. It's created by Google. And it's great, right? Because we have now a more consistent approach uh, across all our apps if we delegate this process into a tool. Uh, so with JIP, we don't need a Docker file at all. And you don't even need a Docker daemon locally, right? So which is perfect for CI. And all we have to do is to set that up by adding a Gradle or Maven plugin to our project. And you can even customize it. Like you don't even need to do this. You don't even need make Gradle or Maven. You can just do it with, with Java itself, right? So you want to customize it even more. So uh, we can write it locally, and we can see that it uses this less by default. Uh, yeah, it's very configurable. And um, one thing we haven't been talking about really are the tags, right? So the same way, you would never go to production with a snapshot in your dependencies. You would never go with latest as your tag, right? Yeah, I think um, it's just it's almost. I kind of wish they never invented latest. Almost, it's just because it provides you no information at all. So let, you know, if I got my app and then latest, it doesn't tell me what version it is, what um, you know, what uh, kind of dependencies it's using. So it's um, yeah. Yeah. So let's see what do we do then, right? So there are different strategies and different ways to configure the tool, right? So here are a few examples. The first one by default, you will use the artifact version, so whatever you have in your YART file. Uh, uh, then we could use a timestamp. And you can set that up into Gradle, or you could use uh, as a parameter. Um, you know, my my favorite now I would say is the GitHub, uh, the Git hash. So I remember the first time I was talking to him about this, I was pretty sure that the way to go was by using timestamp, right? Because as a consumer, it made a lot of sense, right? Because you knew when the image was there, and you know a lot of things. Mm. But then now I would go maybe for a mix in between uh, for pre-releases the GitHub. The Git hash um, for actual final releases, my artifact version. Yeah, I think um, the thing you need to consider is um, who will consume your uh, images. Um, even as a development team, you're going to be consuming each other's images uh, depending on your build process, right? So you might have your app that has a dev build, and then um, your teammate wants to kind of get your changes as an image because that's how we do things these days, right? You know, um, kind of get, uh, pass an image around. So um, the better that uh, you can tag that image, in my opinion, um, it's going to just make life easier. Um, so I think even in the case if you were a solo developer, um, so the, the timestamp thing kind of never makes sense to me because um, how do you identify what that is? You've got your, you do Docker images and you've got a list of images and then maybe I wanted to sort of test out a, an earlier change that I made. So if you used even just the Git hash thing, then I could maybe um, kind of look at my Git history and actually correlate that with a tangible kind of build that I've made and um, you know maybe test some regression, see if that um, still, uh, still exists. Um, so I think for me, um, I would always sort of try and stick to a semantic version and stick uh, as closely as possible to the semantic versioning that you're already using in your team. Um, and I also think it's a really good practice to include information both about the um, base image that you're using um, and also about the kind of um, dependent, the sort of runtime dependency such as JDK, JDK8 or JDK9 or 11. Um, and what you can do as well is make these tags basically floating. So you might have a default. So let's say the default is uh, my app slash um, you know, 1.2.3. And by default, you might get that with Alpine and you might get that with um, JDK 11, for example. But then you could have sort of specializations uh, where you have different versions. And then if you wanted to um, build, get a version of your app with a different, let's say, um, Debian, then you could have that and all that information contained within the tag. So it's really worth for me putting that effort into um, coming up with a good strategy because it also make, make your life easier in the sort of long term, I think. Yeah, definitely. So now that we know more or less how to tag it well, let's see what can we do with it. So in order for our image to be downloaded, we had to put it somewhere, right? And that place is our uh, image registries. Uh, this is what we will upload them. Yeah, sure. I think um, 
Yeah, so there are a few, right? So there are many options. Uh, the first one I would consider is Docker Hub because it's the original one and the most used registry. It is free for the public and paid for private images, and they have an on-prem offering, apparently. So then you have the three big cloud provider registry. So you are using their hosted Kubernetes container services. You know, you can just use their registries. Um, last but not least, Harbor, which is open source. It is by, it was started by VMware, mm -hmm. and it's part of the Cloud Native Container Foundation. And it enables you say, to have their own on-prem registry. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, it, that sort of area of the vulnerability scanning and stuff as well is a really sort of powerful yeah. feature that you can get with. I think a few of them actually do that. So you, they can, you know, if you've got like a, a, an old dependency uh, within your image, it will give you an alert and things. Um, so that's um, a, a big, a big value for a lot of people. Yeah, that's that to me, that's mm. the most, you know, the best thing that Harbor has is definitely this kind right? Yeah. Because while they're you, you have something in your image that shouldn't be there, right? So that's something that would be interesting to see, right? How all this is evolving on that pattern. Yeah, yeah. Right? And you can also just push your own registry if, one, if, if I've done that with like using, um, so if you're using like a mini cube locally or something, um, that's another pattern you can use. Just have a local one for sort of developer builds and things if you want. Yeah. So let's see how to get Git to push the images there. So there are two ways. It's a parameter, or just by using the build the Gradle file, or Maven if you're into that. And I usually use the second option nowadays. Uh, any questions so far? No, no, not really. OK, so now that we have an image in a registry with a tag, we're ready to go into the Kubernetes world. So the first thing I struggled with was with the CLI. Because nobody knows how to pronounce it, really. So some people say keep CTL, some people say keep control, some will say keep cattle. I personally don't pick sides on those kind of battles. So what, not, in order to, not to deal with all this nonsense, I just created an alias the first day, and I'm super happy since then. So this is the CLI we're going to be using on the talk. Um, so the, yeah, the other decision that you need to make, um, and I, I don't think you want to spend too much time making this decision, but which um, Kubernetes cluster do you actually sort of want to use? Um, so I think, as I said in the slide, right, I think if you can use it, a managed service um, by one of the big cloud providers, it's going to be a really sort of sensible choice, especially sort of when you're starting out. Um, so the main um, services are um, Amazon's EKS. Uh, Google's GKE and Azure's AKS, and they've all got their kind of sort of um, pros and cons. So I think historically Google has probably been the front runner. I think it, um, it still is. It's got a lot of really quite advanced features that um, you can uh, get Istio installed, uh, like service mesh installed with your cluster. Um, the uh, deployment time is really, really quite quick. Um, you get all your sort of logging built in with the um, IaaS cloud provider. Um, so it's um, a really sort of good choice if you um, if your company um, is already using um, a cloud vendor, you know you probably want to stick with the one they're already using because it's going to make your sort of time to actually be productive much um, quicker, in my opinion. I think the two main objection, uh, object objections you we might find with this choice is some people don't want a kind of a vendor lock-in um, with the cloud provider, and the other one is cost because it can be quite expensive um, to actually um, spin up these uh, uh, managed clusters. Um, especially when you start sort of scaling them across multiple teams. And quite often what you find is you get a kind of a sprawl of Kubernetes clusters where everyone's got kind of cloud credentials. Every team kind of has their uh, sort of own, or even every person. So the cost starts getting um, really quite, quite big. Um, so I think the other option a lot of people use um, is something like um, Minikube, um, Docker Desktop, or Microcates, and these are all really convenient. Um, they're all really uh, do give you a lot of um, features out of the box, and the, the only issue that I guess you need to be aware of is that um, it's not a real cluster per se. Um, things are a little bit different, especially when you get into areas such as setting up um, like networking, setting up kind of um, physical volumes, things. Are, are very, very similar, but not quite. And you can sometimes just find yourself um, debugging these really sort of small niggly issues. So I think personally, I just use the real cluster. I use the sort of Google or whatever um, managed service. It just then I know at least it's, there's sort of no kind of uh, funny business that I sort of need to deal with really. So um, I think. In, in the actual corporate world, though, you might already have a major ops team. They might want to kind of run the Kubernetes cluster for you, and in, in which case um, you probably want to look at sort of one of the sort of vendor-packaged Kubernetes distros. Um, 
because it's really Kubernetes, it, it is, there's a lot of complexity to the actual cluster itself um, and having the backing of a major vendor, it really is recommended. Um, the license cost is probably going to be worth it when you get called out um, in, the, in the night about a problem that you, you, know, you need the vendor's help with. So um, it's definitely, uh, definitely worth looking into if you're going down that route. Uh, I think each vendor's um, kind of distribution have got their own pros and cons. So for example, OpenShift, um, uh, works uh, uh, has its own kind of uh, some of its own features built on top of the Kubernetes API. So, um, for example, you've got the Roots API, so sort of um, a nice sort of ingress features and things like this, and it also has really good integration with um, OpenStack. Um, and there's also PKS Pivotal PKS has got um, if you're already running um, VMware vSphere, it can be a really good um, choice because it's got really good integration with um, VMware along with um, all the other cloud platforms and also sort of really good cluster health and resurrection features. Um, but it's not a free ride and all of these Kubernetes distributions um, take a lot of sort of food and watering, a lot more maintenance than the uh, managed solutions. Um, so it's appropriate if you're in a, the kind of organization that um, they do want to buy into Kubernetes as a, as a wider strategy. They want to have an ops team actually um, look after it for you um, and support all the things like the kind of um, updates and, and all that kind of thing. So there's uh, another way is called um, kubeadm, I think, kubeadm, Kube, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but really that's just a, a command line tool that will, um, if you take two, some nodes that you've already provisioned, some servers, it will install the cluster on, on there for you. Um, and the real big benefit of using kubeadm is that um, you can get the latest and greatest sort of versions of Kubernetes. You can tweak all the different options um, to your heart's desire. You can break it in a myriad of different ways and <laughs> pull your hair out probably, but it's great. It's a lot better than what it was and um, just using default settings, it will get you um, like a, a working cluster really quickly. But you do need to think a lot more about things like uh, what networking do I want to use? Um, what kind of how am I going to update it? How am I going to patch it? How am I going to keep the nodes up to date? There's just all these things that you wouldn't have to think about. Um, and something I haven't done this, but I think um, a lot of people have really gained a lot of value out of um, following um, Kelsey Hightower's um, Kubernetes the hard way, because that, that's how you really kind of go into a deep kind of detail and installing all the components manually by hand. Yeah, so for local development, we're going to be using Kind, so it stands for Kubernetes in Docker. And it is a tool for running local Kubernetes cluster using Docker containers as nodes. Uh, it is really start, easy to start and you know, create and delete a new cluster. It takes about 30 seconds to spin a new one. Uh, the orbit test is at 20, or my machine took 49, probably because I had you know, Slack or Chrome open that day. But uh, you know, this is where the, our cluster is going to be. But if you can really use a hosted cluster somewhere that's in the cloud, as Oli mentioned, I would highly recommend that. It's going to Keep you, you know, gonna save you from a lot of trouble, especially while debugging networking things, right? Because your your local host is gonna be very different. So we highly advise you to use a development cluster. Mm -hmm. So now that we know the tools we are gonna be using and where we're gonna deploy that, let's take, you know, let's add another concept. And the first thing is gonna be a namespace, right? So a namespace pro it provides a scope for names, and it's a way to divide our cluster resources, right? So namespaces are intended for environments with many uses uh, across multiple teams. But when it's starting, you don't really need them. Like at first, you don't, you know, I don't even want to think about that because you know, start using them where you need the isolation they provide, right? So uh, we're going to be using the default namespace along yeah. this presentation. One, one thing I would say, though, even if you are not using them, still write it down in your manifest because otherwise you can get confused. Because yeah. um, but we'll come to what manifest it looks like. But yeah, do do declare it even if you're using the default. Otherwise, you won't know where things live and you might get confused. Yeah. yeah. So what can we deploy there? So the first thing we can add is a pod which is the smallest deployable unit, literally means a group of whales. And typically, we'll have a one-on-one -on -one relationship application to pod. Because for example, let's say we have a front end, a back end, and a database. If something happens, uh, happens to your front end, the last thing you want to do is to restart your database, right? Mm -hmm. So they're likely to have different life cycles, so they will likely live in different parts, right? So let's see how one looks like. I think one thing I just wanted to mention on the diagram, they, I think most cases probably only have one container, but a pod, the abstraction supports multiple containers. So, but in most cases, it's just a single container. The times you might have multiple containers is where you maybe have like something called a sidecar container that's doing something to help your main app, but usually it's a one-to-one. -one. Yeah. yeah, so this is what the pod looks like, right? So the important things here are, or at least to me, the pod name, the image, and the label. So this is really how you create a pod. There's nothing more than this, right? So congratulations. You're now one step closer to becoming a YAML engineer. 
We'll be so, handing out certificates at the end if you come and see us. So. Yes, yes. I heard there's a demand for it now, you know. So you really want to go and do that for a living. You're on the right track. So congratulations. <laughs> yeah. So we have a bunch of YAML now, and it's a good idea to validate it, right? There are a few IDE tools, like the Cloud Code plugin for IntelliJ, I think for Visual Code as well, it mm -hmm. works, right? Yeah. That helps a lot by writing the YAML. But in the end, you really want to have a validation step all the time, right? Especially for CI. Uh, I just try to add that step as much as I can, because it's very easy to mess it up, right? So for validating, we can do a dry run. And this will do just client-side validation. So if your pod depends on, on some app integration or permissions, that won't fail, right? So this is a new beta command in Kubernetes uh, 1.16. And you, will have, you ca will have this ability to do that on the server side so that you will have actual validation on the server, right? So this is something you have to feature the toggle, by the way. It's not enabled by default. Um, yeah, so let's see what the apply commands create. There we go. So yeah, you know, nothing really super special, right? So the first command will create it, the second will get the pods. We see how the first time is gonna pull the image. Will take a little bit longer the first time, but then after the next execution, after a while, it's gonna get it, right? It's gonna be much quicker the second time, right? Because the image is gonna be cached over there. <coughs> and another very useful populated command that I found or that I use a lot is describe, especially when something goes wrong. This is the first place I come to, right? And there's an IP there that you can see in the bottom, but we try to call it, it will time out. So why is that? So because we need a way, because by default, a pod can only be accessed internally. So we need a, a way to allow traffic to our pod, right? So for that, we're gonna create a service. So a service defines a set of pods and a policy to access them. So the main times are cluster IP, uh, exposed is only inside the cluster, and this is default, the default service type. Then we have node pod, that will expose a, a port uh, to the world, and usually it's about the 30,000 range, I think. And yeah. uh, then you have a load balancer, which exposes the service using a cloud provider load balancer. So let's say you are in Amazon, it will create an ELB for you automatically. So let's see how this actually looks like, right? Yeah, so we see in the end the type, which is node port, which we're gonna be using for this example. And if we take a look at the selector, uh, remember the label we have in our pod definition. So this is how the binding works on Kates. So the selector is going to say, select me all the parts where the key matches the value being app and my app. Right? So this is how the actual connection happens between the two of them. So let's create a service now. And um, if we apply, we can see how it gets created, right? With the type being no ports, right? We can see the port is like 31,106. And this is the range right, that we saw that will assign to us. And uh, we can call it now, right? Because we are, uh, if we're working locally with kind, uh, we have to port forward it again. So this is one of the small pains you'll have to suffer if you're not using a real development cluster, right? So you're locally, you have to port forward the things for you. And then we can now call our Cello World app, right? So now that we know how to create a pod, how to access it, um, there's a problem with creating the pods manually. And the problem is that we are responsible for the pods life cycle, right? Because pods are mortal and if something happens to them, they won't recover. So to help with that, we're going to use a replica set. And a replica set uh, is used to maintain the number and the running state of the pods. So you can also do cool things like, hey, I want to auto-scale my pod based on properties like the CPU load. So let's see how one looks like. Actually, you can see that well. So if we take a look at the diff, you can see how the replica set object contains a pod object, but just with a tiny section, right? Uh, which is where we specify how many replicas do we want. And yeah, if I think it's just to say, because you know, uh, one thing is worth noting, you never actually create a pod in, uh, directly uh, in Kubernetes. You're always going to be um, dealing with one of these high level um, kind of types just because they give you so many sort of benefits, really. So. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so we apply that replica set. We see how we can take a look at the H, right? So it created two new pods and, they, and left the old one we had, right? So we see also the status, right? Uh, we see how many we requested, how many currently have. So let's try something fun and delete the old pod to see what happens. So we delete it. It gets created automatically, right? So how cool is that? Because you know this isn't like demo, so it's obviously gonna work, right? And yeah, so <laughs> replica sets are really not the typical object we will be typically working with. Uh, the object will be a deployment. So a deployment contains all the things that a replica set has 
and also ensures that any update we make to our pod does not cause any downtime. Mm -hmm. So also that means I support rollover updates and rollbacks, which is really, really useful most of the time. And to move from a replica set to a deployment, we have to do a massive amount of work, just basically changing the kind <laughs> from one to the other. All right. So this is the object that we're going to be using. If we apply that, we see how the new deployment object is created over there, right? So we can also see if the pods are ready or not, and we'll see what that means in a little bit. But now, you know, you could be thinking now, we came a long way, uh, having to build all that YAML manually was a bit of a pain, right? And it was, really. So we are going to show how to better get started with this. The first way is with a dry run. So th this command is going to output almost what we have in our deployment.yaml and our service.yaml. Uh, so just by telling it, please do not apply for real, just do a dry run, and output, the, uh, output in YAML format, will have almost the same output. So now you can take that, uh, update it with the labels you need, and ideally version control it, which is a very important thing to do as well. But if you hate YAML as much as I do, there is a tool for that. So that correct helps with generating the manifest by just adding a dependency to the class path and some properties or annotations. So it's an example of using some properties in order to generate exactly the same deployment we had before. So now it is really up to you to generate how do you want to generate that YAML, right? So let's see the trade-offs. And with that correct, you don't need YAML, which is obviously a nice thing. Uh, you need very little config or annotation to generate the manifest. And with the dry run, it's very low level, right? We are still writing the actual YAML, but you can version control it, right? And uh, you can template it and integrate it with all the tools. Like, for example, today, uh, Decorate does not integrate with JIP. There is an open issue on the repo, and they're super active, actually, in the community. Like, I open a few PRs, and they're super, you know, they're really quick on the responding, so I'm sure that we'll see more great integrations. Yeah, so yeah I think, um, yeah, so I think, um, I, so I really like what Decorate's done, and I, I totally agree with the mission of um, making uh, a letting us write less YAML and making having a type safe um, way of doing it I think is brilliant. One thing I really don't agree with is that I think um, that it's a kind for me at least the Kubernetes deployments an orthogonal um, concern to the um, application and I think we'll see in a bit right that about what uh, how it works but uh, where you have to kind of decorate your app to say um, in some cases to describe how it's um, running on um, Kubernetes and I think actually having that as an external configuration is it feels to me like um, a sort of a more sensible way of doing it because it's a separation there of um, sort of concerns you can kind of take that deployment as a file and put it somewhere else I know it generates it but for me it's is that where it's that kind of separation of um, uh, yeah I still prefer the dry run as well and even though some of our colleagues they say no I really prefer decorate because once you know it is very easy to keep you going and you know but to me the integration with the tools is key for the success so today we don't really know what this is going to look like in the future but today this is how you can do it and in our deployment uh, we saw before we saw we can see this ready and what does this ready mean in the deployment context so that means that having our, the container started does not mean that they're ready to accept traffic, right? So Kubernetes provides uh, to help us with this, uh, you know, help us by providing probes, and they will periodically be running some checks. And it is really important to understand them because leaving them to the default is going to lead to terrible consequences. And so Kubernetes uses a leftness probe to know when to restart a container and a readiness probe to know when to start accepting traffic, right? So a pod is ready when all the containers are ready. And this is one of the main things that people get wrong. It's like a really common. Yeah, and this is the ways you can get it wrong, for example. Yeah. So the problems I have seen are no probes at all or using the same path for the readiness and the liveness. And this will make our container, uh, our container available when it should not be. So let's say our app integrates with services, right, or databases, or take a long time to start maybe, right? Let's say you have to allow a lot of that time memory for some reason. You don't want to accept traffic right there. So you use one of the uh, first two options, then you will probably really be accepting traffic when you shouldn't. And the most common mistake is making the liveness depending to an external check, like a service or a database, because you know, one single flake on that external service is going to make your container restart. This is definitely what you don't want to do, right? Imagine you are scaling out to hundreds of instances. Just one thing, it can cause a massive cascade, right? So please do not do that. So what do we set them to? So we set the liveness pro to actuator info, or something that say, hey, I'm alive. You know, don't restart me. And the readiness to the actuator health, right? Because this is perfect. We want to be accepting traffic only when our external integration and dependencies are ready, right? 
So they're both uh, enabled by default with Spring Boot when adding actuators. And um, what's mentioning that after boot 2.2, uh, or the other actuator endpoints are going to be disabled because of the security, but these two ones are always going to be enabled by default, so you can use them safely. Um, yeah. I think the way I just say the way I find it helpful to understand when liveness is ready is so liveness. I care about my my kind of individual isolation, um, my individual piece of deployment. So my container as a single singular thing. So that um, that's uh, I don't want to care about the independent dependencies. But with readiness, it's do, does this thing want traffic, right? You know, is it is it safe to you know is it healthy? So that's um, for me anyway how I rationalise that. But cool. Yeah, there are other values you can set, but you know they're going to really depend. So this is what the beautiful YAML looks like. Uh, you know, this is on the Git repo, so I'm not really worried about that. Just pay attention to the types. Well, you can see the type, the liveness proof goes does a get to that path on that pod on the schema. You can use different strategies to do this, and you can see a lot of the values there, right? That gonna be, you know, they really depend on the application on what you are gonna do, and you should know your app, right? So this is something you have to manually go and think about. Yep. And this is how you do it with decorate. So you can do with, uh, with mention, with uh, annotations or with properties. Uh, the future versions of annotate is going to generate this by default, right? So you don't really need to specify that. So today, as it was, or last week, how it was, it was liveness prod equals to health as well. So we sent a PR and it got matched super quickly. So this is going to be by default, right? Just by adding act to it and decorate to your class, but this is going to be automatically generated for you. So, you know, it's a good sign, I guess. And yeah, for you to know, if your application takes longer to start than the minimum threshold that you can specify, uh, for example, that when you have to load a lot of data in order for everything to be ready, uh, since Kubernetes 1.16, there's a new alpha feature that is called a startup prop that's going to help you with the warm up. Uh, one thing to consider that if you are using an alpha feature and a managed case, that means that it's going to be there maybe in a year because it takes three months uh, for an alpha to beta. And then there's always a lag in all those managed services between three months or usually six, so don't expect this soon. But if you're on bleeding edge, you can totally use this right now. You just have to feature toggle it. Yeah, I think as a whole, you've got to be quite careful with, like, especially when you're reading the documentation, you might see, like for example, the other day I saw pod preset and got really excited and then realized that um, that's actually alpha. So I think, um, so yeah, those, the documentation does tend to be uh, at the latest version, so you just need to sometimes rationalize what um, your uh, uh, version of things are, but it does a, uh, Kubernetes does a, as a whole is great at versioning, and that's one thing that's brilliant at is um, actually making sure that the, those transitions are, are in a good period of time. And they yeah, I think you know the whole foundation is very you know picky and careful, and yeah. you know when coming to alpha and beta releases, so and, you know something to consider. All right, so now that we know how to you know properly create an application, containerize it, deploy to Kates, it's time for us to iterate over it, and the manner way we'll have to go you know execute jib, k apply and again and again, and so on and so on, right? So we're going to introduce a few tools that are going to help us with the workflow, right? So that we ha don't have to do this manually all the time. And the first tool is called Scaffold, and it automatically detects your changes, uh, compiles your application, and deploys it for you, right? So this tool integrates really well with JIP and with the IntelliJ Cloud uh, Code plugin, the same with... Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the VS code, the yeah. code thing. I don't even know the name. So, which makes really key for a great developer experience. So, to use it, guess what? More YAML. <laughs> you know, we create a file called scaffold.yaml, and we will specify the image and that we want to integrate with GIF. And because we have the plugin installed, the Cloud Call plugin installed, we can do things out of the box, like adding a remote breakpoint, which is really useful and it works just out of the box. You install the plugin, say, hey, and this is scaffold debug, and this is that for you, right? So you mean you can say that manually, but with this plugin, I found it super useful, right? And it does also a couple of more things. So it port forward so that you don't have, you know, you don't have to dis do this manual step, right? My, for port forwarding, it strings the log for you, and it automatically redeploys the app after every change, right? So that's pretty cool. And this is the tool I use the most, you know. I totally, you know, recommend. So even on Minikube, um, you'd think that they, uh, your service is available, um, but because it, uh, it's just on your local machine, but actually it's not because of Kubernetes has got its own internal cluster network, and that's why you need this kind of um, port, port forwarding thing. Um, uh, and the other thing I think the Scaffold does, it can actually generate that YAML for you. So I think I see when in IntelliJ, you can, you can basically uh, open an action and you can say, um, I think it's uh, set up Kubernetes deployment and that will automatically um, do uh, that for you. So uh, cool. it's still YAML, you don't, might not have to write it initially at least. So. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I recently discovered another tool that looks really interesting to test some cases. It is called Octito. And it helps us with 
code hot deploys, I mean ho code hot reloads. So I'm not sure you have ever used a Spring Boot DevTools, but it's a very interesting project that helps you with that locally, right? So meaning that if you touch a line of code, it will automatically apply without having to recompile the whole thing and restart your app. So this tool does that, but not locally, but in our case cluster. So to get us up and running, we add the dependency to DevTools, we install their CLI and run a couple of CLI commands, and it will create a deployment and a um, environment for us. And that environment inside there, we can do the following. We can start our app, right? We say little uh, boot run inside that environment. We can see how the live reload server is running as well. So now we go to our IDE, we make a change to our app, and we'll fill something like this. This is the experience, right? So you do call hello world, you change the text to live, and it will automatically do the hello world live. But not locally, but in the case cluster, right? So I usually prefer to have proper unit and integration test. But sometimes you really have to iterate over something that is in the cluster. This is really a very useful tool for that, to get that job done. So keep this in mind. Yeah, I, uh, so Scaffold does have some hot reload, but it's only for things like static files and stuff. So if you change like a JavaScript file or something like that, then you can set up hot reload for that, but not in the sort of same way. That, yeah, that this that is like know. the actual class, right? So the actual stream yeah. that you have there is going to be hot deployed. So that's yeah. pretty useful for yeah. some cases, I guess. Um, yeah, so let's try to imagine now our CI CD pipeline, right? We know how to fill a lot of the boxes. Uh, we know how to iterate over our app. We know how to put the image in a registry. We know how to push that image, you know, and how to deploy it to Kate. But in a real world, we typically have more than one environment with different values and services and properties for each, right? So let's see how to do that. So we can use a tool called Customize, and it allows you to customize manifest without touching the original YAML. Or would you prefer a fancier definition? I cannot read. That's the one. <laughs> uh, yeah. So how do you use it, Tada? More YAML and the CLI help us with generating it. And all we have to tell that hey, those are my two base files, right? So in this case, going to be our deployment and our service. And um, if we apply this example, it does nothing new, right? Just print the two files concatenated uh, in a, you know the same way we could have done before. But there are some capabilities we can use from this that are more interesting to me, and there are the overlays. So. To use that, we have to change our file structure. We have to say, this is our base, right? This is the deployment that I don't want you to touch at all. And we want to apply some overlays on top, right? In this case, we're going to apply a development and a production uh, overlay. All this example on the GitHub repo, by the way, so don't worry a lot about this. And we can now say things like, hey, for development, have one replica. For production, I want you to have five replicas. But imagine the power of this, right? This is just the beginning. We could be saying things like, uh, set an environment variable, set my spin profile, the config, and so on, right? And if you are using any templated tool, you know, for whatever reason, <laughs> the, this can be the input to these files as well, right? So this is really, really powerful tool that you can yeah. use a lot. Huh? I think for me, actually, this is um, where the, um, uh, the kind of Kubernetes uh, development process really comes into its own, because um, what you can do here, where you see you've got, for example, that templated value. So that could be, um, and that could be, for example, like um, you might be calling uh, another process like Ansible to deploy a database. So then you may have, I, you know, this isn't a great practice, but you might have something like an in-memory database that gets set up um, for your like development or um, something like a real PostgreSQL for your production. Um, and you can kind of activate these prof profiles based on sort of different parameters and things. Um, so I think that's definitely, uh, and uh, the way to sort of be going and, and you, it avoids kind of having to do a lot of uh, like templating, which I think in the past, the, the tools that have done template, templating, although it means that you write less YAML, you end up kind of with something that can be quite difficult to actually sort of um, read and, and manage. Uh, yeah, and debug. So this is, and this is part of Kubernetes now. Um, it's part of um, the, um, I don't want to say kubectl, I don't know which is the right thing anymore, but um, yeah. <laughs> it's CLI. actually part, it's built into the tool itself. So it's completely um, supported by the Kubernetes community. This is the thing, this is almost certainly what you want to be sort of looking at as soon as you, uh, uh, you know, kind of start moving um, sort of further on with your um, sort of getting your apps onto Kubernetes. Yeah, if you go to the documentation, customize is all over as well, right? Like all the examples are, is applying this file. So you can see that this is going to be probably the tool of choice for everybody. All right, so now that this is how you apply it, you know, you can print the output just in case you want to see what's happening, just customize build. And this will be how the last box of our pipeline could look like, right? So this is an example of it. And yeah, so do we have any questions?
So the question was, um, Kubernetes is quite similar to Docker Compose, so can we kind of compare? Um, so for me, um, the big difference between Docker Compose and uh, Kubernetes um, is the kind of facilities you get around um, high availability. And so we didn't want to go into too many details about all the features, but things like you can do uh, like a rolling upgrade, so like a sort of a deploy V1 of your app, V2 of your app um, at the same time. And then um, you can do things like have, you know, traffic kind of start, you know, start, so it's a kind of a rolling seamless upgrade and rollback and things like that. Um, there is actually a tool, I think it's called Compose with a K and that actually lets you take a Docker Compose file and convert it um, to a Kubernetes deployment. So there's definitely an overlap. I, I guess it, I would say that uh, probably Docker Compose gets you, you know, maybe it kind of gets you sort of some of the way, um, and then Kubernetes builds on a lot of the ideas and just um, it gives you a lot more production ready sort of features, really. Um. Yeah, for the day one, Docker Compose looks okay, but for day two, when you care about your availability and you care about how your apps are like, then you are going to need something more powerful than that, ideally, uh, because otherwise you're going to have to manually create a lot of process around that in order to keep that highly available. It's like another something very overwhelming to do, really. All right, any more questions? Okay. 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 So going back to our diagram, right? We have been using a node pod from our services to talk to them to the outside, and uh, we're going to see how properly expose them to the internet, right? And how says we discovery works on Kates. So we are going to be using a new app, right? That just returns a list of customers. It is similar to the Hello World one, but now we're going to make it available to the world and to other services. So um, services really are quite a core concept in Kubernetes. So I you know, wanted to sort of just, I know we've mentioned them briefly, but I just wanted to um, go over them on a little bit more depth. Um, so and one of the major benefits of Kubernetes is it does make exposing your app to the sort of the wider internet really quite a simple process. But with many of these things, it's actually a little bit more sort of nuanced um, than uh, it, it, than you would see at first glance. And the simplest way that we used before, um, which is using a node port, is almost certainly um, not the right choice. So I'll say why, and that's because with a node port, um, I think you saw earlier, it started up on some random port up over 30,000. So that's always going to be the case. So you're always going to have this kind of ephemeral high port, and you can't, um, so that's always going to be allocated to you. And also, um, you need to sort of set up DNS and things to point at one of the node IPs. So for um, high availability and stuff, it's, um, it's not the way to go. Um, but for demos, I think um, it's absolutely not a, not, not a problem. But um, I think um, as a, basically what services, I guess, the goal of them uh, is to access your pods, um, not just externally, but also internally as well, um, which we're going to talk a little bit about service discovery in, in a while. Um, so you could have a deployment or a set of pods replica set without a service, and um, it, it, it still would work. But the, the problem that you're going to have is that um, your, um, the, the pods, you would need to sort of know exactly what they're kind of, you'd need to somehow look up their um, sort of DNS name yourself or something, and, or the IP address. And then these things are completely, um, they'll sort of change at a moment's notice, right? Because um, of the way uh, Kubernetes, you saw the replica set example, you know, it can um, move pods around, move them onto different nodes, um, it'll sort of roll, roll them and stuff. So you just can't rely on the actual sort of address of, of a pod itself. That's why you kind of have this um, service that uh, sits in front of it. Um, so I think if you're wondering why, uh, the picture is of actually of Clapham Junction. Um, and for me, that kind of felt like a fairly useful analogy for understanding how uh, services work. So if you think if you kind of lived on a really small island, you might just have a single train line that, um, you know, kind of goes in and out to one, one or two destinations. And in that case, you know, it's like your node port. It's, it's really simple, but you don't have to sort of worry too much about um, kind of um, sort of routing things to different destinations. But you get to sort of uh, kind of Clapham Junction. That's where you really need to start thinking about um, your kind of your services. And it's, um, you know, that might be a case of where you've got all these sort of different microservices. They all need to sort of um, uh, kind of have different sort of uh, routes to them and stuff, and you need to make sure that um, your traffic gets to gets to the sort of right place by configuring them. So, it's just a little uh, diagram of um, what a, a sort of load balance service looks like, when we covered it um, a little bit earlier. 
But um, this is a really quite a simple way of um, exposing your deployment and what it does, it actually backs off to your uh, cloud provider and that will, you say, create me a service of a load balancer type. What that will go off and do is um, give you a, a, a public IP address from your cloud provider and it will go and create a, um, like a, a load balancer service. So there's, depending on which cloud you're using, if it's um, at Amazon, you've got Elastic Load Balancer and a few and different ones now. And um, so it will do that. And, um, and actually that's kind of Kubernetes has kind of got that built, that kind of feature built into it. So it knows how to talk to the different um, cloud providers and do that um, uh, kind of thing. Um, but the, there's a couple of things that you do need to be aware of with this. And that's um, every time you do this, it's going to incur a cost. Um, that's going to be a cost for the sort of load balancer usually. And it, it could be um, a cost of the IP address as well. And there's also um, each cloud provider kind of has sort of different um, ways of uh, doing load balancers, especially when you're kind of looking at things um, like setting up TLS. So for example, I think um, on Amazon, uh, you have to have like an annotation on your service to say this is where my um, uh, TLS certificate lives. So there's just these kinds of things that you um, need to be aware of. So, um, but the, the the main benefits, as I said, it's um, you know it's quite a, a simple way of um, sort of setting this up. Um, and it, for most, for a lot of cases, it's really um, probably robust enough um, for the um, for the things you that you're going to sort of do day to day. But um, I think as soon as you kind of get into a more um, sort of uh, uh, advanced maybe set up uh, using lots of microservices then um, you may well want to sort of look at um, setting up something like an ingress which gives you sort of much more flexible routing and you don't have the same problem with incurring a kind of all these kind of costs for different sort of load balancer setups um, another thing of note as well is that um, if you're using like an on-prem Kubernetes, they don't have always have sort of um, load balancers um, available to them because there's no there isn't always a concept of like a, a like a load balancer. So some do. I know that um, PKS. Um, if you're running that on VMware um, with I think it's NSXT, then it will give you a load balancer. I'm not sure about the other um, distros, but there's something called um, Metal LB that you can use to kind of get the same um, sort of setup as a load balancer service. Yeah, so then we saw that services don't spread that thing, so let's do something different, right? So let's see what an ingress is. So an ingress exposes routes from outside the cluster to services within the cluster, right? So let's see how one looks like. And yeah, so ingress supports path and host-based routing with a standard entry point, right, to all the services. So we can see it's an array, so we can specify more than one thing over there. And on this example, we're telling the ingress to map uh, the base path to the service name uh, service my app provider on the port 8080. Right? And if we apply, we can call now the address on the port 80, right? And it will be redirected to our service. Uh, now, you know, this is a much better way to process the whole traffic because everything is centralized in one way, right? But note that if you want to test this locally, by the way, you have to, you know, because this is not a real development cluster. Uh, this wouldn't work at all, right? So that's why having a real development cluster really helps with debugging, especially with all this networking. So, uh, yeah, I kind of, um, when I was thinking about what an ingress kind of looked like, um, I kind of thought of, yeah, like the blocker lemmings and some home coming through the same door. So that's why the Giphy's up there. But I think in our, ex in our experience, um, the for most product, when you're kind of looking at production kind of configurations, I think nearly always for me the way to go is with an ingress and and actually having um, a cluster IP service because um, that means that um, y your things are a lot more locked down. You're not kind of exposing an extra kind of load balancer IP, so you have an internal um, IP for your service that um, only the load balancer uh, that only the ingress can actually um, talk to. So um, what? The way I think of an ingress, it's like a reverse proxy or a, an API gateway. And instead of um, being, so with a service, it can only decide where to route traffic at lay layer four. And that basically means using the IP address and port to, to sort of dispatch where um, a request goes to. But with an ingress, it works at layer seven. So you've got available to you things like the, um, the actual HTTP URL. So you can, based on that kind of path and things like we saw in that manifest earlier, you can actually use that to um, route your um, traffic to pods in a much more intelligent way. Um, and out of the box, usually a lot of ingress um, technology offers um, different features as well. So you can rewrite um, URLs. You could maybe, for example, the typical example is rewriting HTTP to HTTPS. Um, you can do um, load balancing between different services using your own kind of algorithms. Um, 
you can terminate TLS, which is probably one of the um, um, big things that most of you, you, you will do because these days you know, everyone's running TLS, so getting that sort of set up in a um, sort of a decent way, uh, especially now there's things like um, uh, it's TLS certificates are much cheaper than they used to be, or free even, so it's um, something to, um, definitely worth, uh, that you need to set up. Um, or you might want to um, add like, uh, or you can add authentication as well, so anything coming into your ingress could um, be authenticated. Um, or even adding like custom headers and things. So there's just yeah loads of options that you can do with an ingress that you can do with just a regular um, service. Um, so the most popular one because um, is nginx. It's called uh, Ingress nginx, and that's actually maintained by the Kubernetes community. Um, if you in, when you have uh, your Kubernetes cluster, that's probably got its own ingress. So it's just worth understanding what's already available to you. Um, I quite like having um, using uh, ingress nginx because it means then you can install that um, and use have the same configuration across multiple clusters. Then so it's um, kind of a good way of um, of sort of doing things. Um, but I think the way that ingress actually works, the way I think of it, if you've ever uh, configured a web server before, it's a little bit like you have these like virtual hosts or upstream sections. So every time you kind of um, add in, um, it could change your ingress, it's almost like the controller is actually um, changing like a, a web server configuration file. At a simple level, it's you know, more or less what, what happens. Right, so reality is that application will be talking to other apps or services. So we could add the database and the services in the same pod, or everything's on the same pod, but we just say that it was a terrible idea, right? Because we you have them to have different life cycles. So how do we do this communication to happen, right? in this you know, dynamic environment, right? So in previous examples, uh, we created a few of the services, but we didn't query all of them. So there is completely one that's very interesting, which is called KubeDNS, Cube, uh, uh, KubeDNS inside the Cube system namespace. So we search in, in one of the containers, and we look at the DNS resolver of the pod. Uh, we see how we have an entry where we see the uh, name server with the same IP address as that cute DNS, right? And what does that really mean? So that means that in case we can just referentiate our services by name, you know, it's as simple as that, right? So let's see that in action. So we are going to create another app. It's just going to curl. I mean, it's just going to get the customer that we have in the other place, right? So we're just going to add a provider URL, which is the interesting thing, right? So we're just going to concatenate the values and say welcome. So what does this you know, provider.url looks like? Right? That's the interesting piece, right? So since we are, you know, the service name we chose, what service my app provider, this is what will be used to consume our application, right? So we can see how just specifying the service name, we can access uh, the provider service. And if we were in a different namespace, we can referentiate it by using the fully qualified domain name. In this case, will be like the service app provider, other namespace, dot service, and whatever port it's on it. And now we can call our app, right, and get the welcome. I think um, one thing I wanted to say is that just um, the value of service discovery. Um, for me, when I kind of first started working uh, with things like Kubernetes, it wasn't really clear why we needed this, because before it was always like, you know, I'd go to my cloud provider or, or something or a VM, and I'd get a DNS name assigned to me. But that, that you know, that just, that, you, everything's more dynamic in Kubernetes because um, the, the, these things sort of, you know, it, it can change so much. You, you know, a new service gets created, you want um, your other services to be able to um, access it, and it's so dynamic that they, um, so you, you can't hard code it anymore. That's the, the, key, the key thing, really, isn't it? I think um, that's how I understand it. Cool. So, questions? Question there. Just uh, did you have any experience with traffic and other kind of ingress which become more and more popular, especially with the K3S distro? Yeah, so the question was um, have we had any experience um, using um, traffic um, as a, an as an ingress, so I've played around with it a little bit myself, um, and I think um, it, it, I think it probably has got quite a bit of more um, sophistication than um, the nginx um, ingress, as I understand it. So if you're looking for the kind of use case where you want um, to configure sort of more advanced um, kind of routing rules, something like um, traffic is definitely going to be worth um, sort of looking at as well. Um, that's, just that's quite a few. If you look on the ingress page for Kubernetes website, it actually lists all the ones that are available. Um, there's yeah, a lot of different um, ones available. You can even get an ingress that will go off and configure a real hardware um, F5 load balancer, I believe, and that's, so there's, yeah, there's all, there's, there's, you've got a myriad of, uh, of options, and it's always going to depend on, I think, A, your use case, but also B, what you're kind of already using, what you're sort of, um, 
sort of comfortable with. Uh, I think the good thing is that you've got this abstraction that their things are kind of configured in a, at least a similar sort of, sort of way, so you don't have to kind of learn every single tool, and you should in theory be better sort of chop and change between them, sort of depending on your needs. Does that answer your question? More questions? Yep, over there. What exactly is the difference between an ingress and a load balancer, or where sits the load balancer before or after the ingress? So the question is, what is the difference between um, a load balancer and an ingress? And which one sort of sits first? Is it the kind of the load balancer and the ingress? This is kind of a, a little bit of... Um, so the answer is uh, uh, a, a load balancer service um, would sit... Um, before, uh, uh, so that, that service, the green box there, the service, that could be a load balancer service. That would be backed by um, a cloud provider's load balancer with a public IP address. And then your ingress would also be backed, in theory, probably be also be backed by a load. So you'd have two kind of cloud load balancers kind of operating. So um, I don't set things up that way. So what I do, I set up, I set up the service using a cluster IP. So that's um, like an internal IP only that you can only, only be seen by the um, by the ingress itself. So um, I think if you had a load balancer service, that would um, get you some of the way. You wouldn't necessarily need an ingress until you start needing more advanced kind of routing and things like that. But, but once you do start, um, once you do have a need for an ingress, you might as well um, just use um, like a, a, a cluster IP there because it's, um, it's just one less IP address to worry about, in, in my opinion. Oh, a question there. So the question is, I said that a um, ingress service is similar to a reverse proxy, but what is the difference? Um, good question. Um, I think a reverse proxy, for me anyway, really just is um, a kind of more of an abstract thing, really. It's, um, it's kind of a, a way of getting um, uh, traffic from inbound to another service. So I think they're actually the same things, really, conceptually, except when, when I've dealt with anything like a reverse proxy um, in the past, it's been you know, something a bit more manually configured or even like something like you know, hardware devices and things. So I think really Ingress is just a Kubernetes-specific way of setting up a, a reverse proxy type um, uh, uh, setup, amongst other things, mm -hmm. would be how I would understand yeah, it. Totally. Yeah, totally. No more questions? Okay, so we can take a break. Okay, so thanks a lot for coming back. Uh, hopefully really. you had a nice coffee and, and feeling a little bit refreshed for some more fun and games of Kubernetes. Yay. So let's keep going. So, some applications and services may require persisting some data, right? So because pods are ephemeral, uh, they will likely die and the data will be removed, right? So for that, case provides an amazing feature called uh, persistent volumes which is kind of a folder that won't get lost on a restart. So typically, you should not need that as an application developer, right? Because you don't want to violate the 12 uh, factor app principles. So, but this is especially useful when you're developing service or working with services. I think this is one of the areas where I, um, that Kubernetes, although we might advise, you know, it will provide you what you need, it, even if you're right, it, you know, kind of lifting, you're shifting your application, so to speak. I think um, you, you generally got uh, most of the facilities you need, and um, you're not kind of forced to make kind of loads of development changes um, upfront in order to. Um, you know, we've actually moved to Kubernetes. One of the sort of um, big things, really, um, is kind of um, making that experience for the user as seamless as possible, and not having to kind of implement any kind of um, you know, it's all there for you. Things like storage. You know, here you go. It's just like a, a desk mounted onto your um, service. So, yeah, really good point. So we're going to be using Mongo as an example because the data is kept in a very well-known directory, which is DataDB. So we're going to specify what do we want. That we, well, we want the data to be created and to create a directory if it doesn't exist. And we're using a host path, which mounts the directory uh, from the host file system into our pod. But sadly, this looks cool, but depending on the infrastructure provider we are using, the volume time will vary. So in this case, we are using GCE, and for that we need a GCE persistent disk. Right? So you will have to create this disk in your IAS before trying to mount this volume. However, uh, Kubernetes provided uh, an abstraction called persistent volume claim 
in order to decouple this. So instead of adding our IAS uh, config into our pod, uh, we will referentiate a claim. So I think this is like a separation of concerns, really. So you've got your operator who's in charge of creating disks. Developers don't want to do that. You don't want to know all these uh, intrinsic details of what kind of type of disk you need. Exactly, you just um, want to be able to say, okay, I, I, want, I want 300 gigs, please, and, and keep it nice and simple, really. Exactly. So uh, that's, you know, now we're decoupling the creation with the administration of the resources, right? So we see, I just referentiating, hey, I have a claim, and I don't even care which IAS am I using under the hoods, right? So this is a really nice way to split that, you know, that's creation and administration of the resources. So um, stateful workloads on Kubernetes actually um, is really quite a, a little bit of a controversial topic. Um, so uh, Kelsey Hightower is one of the main kind of developer um, advocates from Google on Kubernetes. And I think certainly in his opinion, you can see from his sort of tweets there is, um, you know, Kubernetes supports stateful workloads and it does a good job of it, right? But at the end of the day, it's hard. It's so much harder than um, running a stateless workload. And containers um, are really great. Uh, if, there's, if there's no kind of storage dependency, um, everything's ephemeral. It, it marries so perfectly with the uh, model of you know, just being uh, having a container that's ephemeral and not worrying. Um, things are left behind. As soon as you kind of um, introduce uh, kind of state into the equation, there's um, just more uh, things that um, potentially um, could, sort of could go wrong. Um, I think even, um, you know, some people even go as far as saying you have kind of only this node can run persistent workloads and it will have a different configuration um, for security and performance reasons, whereas all the other workloads go onto different nodes. So it really does um, kind of um, make things more complicated. That's not to say you shouldn't do it, but um, the other, there is another way of doing it, um, and that's not to run your stateful workloads on Kubernetes at all. And that's basically what Kelsey um, is advocating for. So you could, if you wanted, just do it the old way. So just use, you know, Ansible or something or, um, to kind of create a database node somewhere or, you know, use the one that your ops team already gives you. I mean, Kubernetes doesn't sort of care. You can still connect a, a pod to an external database. Um, there's even more sophisticated sort of technologies out there. There's something called Crossplane, which um, kind of automates this process even further and will kind of provision external cloud-provided databases like RDS for you as part of, you know, so it looks like it's part of Kubernetes. So um, I definitely think, um, um, if you just think about how complicated it would be you're trying to manage like um, uh, something like a message queue and, 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 and you know, nodes are going down all of a sudden and it, it's, it just has a whole load of um, things you've got to yeah, think about. Yeah. yeah, so on the previous examples, we were just hard coding our properties in an application properties file, which is not realistic, right? Like real applications will contain different type of configurations. Uh, you have hard config, which is something that will never change and they will be required to be bundled with your app. And then you have soft config, right? That it may change and it may even change in runtime, like A-B test. So we'll see how to pass configuration through our application using a config map. So config maps are volumes that we mount into our container. We can create them by using the CLI, just from literal, passing the values through. Uh, you can do it from a file or just using the good old YAML, you know. So we are going to create one called database configuration. And the way, uh, you know, there are a couple of ways to read that config map from our app. And the first one is through an environment variable, right? So we see there, we say environment from and the config map reference, right? So uh, how does it actually look like? Right? We go inside the container. How does this feel like? So uh, we like to SSH in, really. So we see that you know, the values are there in the environment. We just echo the variables we provide in the config map, and those are going to be there, right? There's another way to pass the values through, and that way is by mounting it into a volume, right? So it's like a file on disk now. So for that, we are going to create a new config map with an application properties, and so, you know, because what Spring understands well, and this is how we read it, right? So we are going to tell our deployment to mount uh, into that mount path called config. And we are going to say, hey, give me the key, which is my actual file application, the properties. And we SSH in again. We'll see how, you know, well, we are going to create another application, actually, just to read the value from. And we SSH in. We see that inside config application properties is our file, right? So that's our. That's how this works, right? Yeah, I think this is another good example where um, config maps give you that sort of flexibility so you can do things in the 12-factor way if that's where, if you've got a cloud-native app already or if um, you, know, you want to just put your config file there, um, you've kind of got support 
for, for, for both ways. So, so the interesting thing is actually, com so in Kubernetes, you have a notion of a volume, so a config map and a persistent volume right there, but you know, the, under the hoods are there, they're kind of the same underlying abstraction, but you're just getting these extra, um, like it's, it's easier to configure, more suitable for um, configuration purposes, so. Yeah. So. On to, yeah, so um, for as soon as we kind of start talking about actually kind of exposing um, our application on the internet, are we, and, you know, just in our own kind of, um, work environments, you know, um, we start really needing to think about um, sort of security for our application and, um, you know, what Kubernetes um, can, can do for us. Yeah. So, uh, secrets first. Yeah, so the first thing we can do, not only, not instead of using a config map, uh, uh, Kate's provide us a kind of object called secrets. So you can, it allows you to define them basically for encoded, among other things, to see well, how that, uh, you know, what it looks like. So we encode over value, and then we can create a new object called secret with the value over there, right? And the way to mount this is very similar as before, right? Now you just say, hey, I'm a secret, and my name is this object that I just created, right? Uh, however, if we're SSHing, the password is still there, and that, you know, not that everybody has access, you know, there are a lot of security around creating this object, not everybody's gonna be able to access it, and that doesn't mean, you know, if you're using these for example, people cannot SSH in, so, you know, it may not be the end of the world, but for some organizations, having a credential touching disk, you know, it's not something that you wanna be, you know, it's not allowed, right? It makes sense for a lot of the organizations. So there are a few ways in order to, you know, uh, solve this problem that we found at least. So the first one is encrypting the data and rest, which is something your cl uh, cluster administrator has to enable. And then a really cool project from Vietnami called uh, Sealed Secrets, so that you can uh, encrypt now everything on Git, and yeah. And only the controller is the only one that is enabled to decrypt that, right? So not even you have access to these credentials anymore, which is pretty cool. And then using, or the last one will be using a well-known tool like Vault, which is probably, as of today, mm -hmm. the tool that people will use. So with the Git, oh, so you talked about the sealed secret, that's basically then the client, your, you as, a, uh, as a, the operator or the engineer, you know, has some tools to actually encrypt it, and then you and tell that, and that key's available somewhere else to sort of, exactly. sort of decrypt it, right? So it's, um, yeah. yeah, I think, um, um, I think uh, the secrets is definitely one of those areas where the Kubernetes has faced um, probably a little bit of um, certainly. I don't want to say criticism, but certainly a sort of detailed um, questioning. But um, it feels like it is the story um, sort of is getting a lot better. But it kind of feels to me like it's ripe for innovation as well. And mm -hmm. like um, I know that, in, uh, so we did a lot of work in Cloud Foundry and, the, and this, and you know, we kind of I felt like the experience was felt a bit more. Um, Matteo is the yeah. word, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, yeah, like it doesn't shine yet, right? But still, mm. Kate is old, but not that old, and it's not as old as, for example, Cloud Foundry has yeah. been yeah. there for yeah. decades almost. Yeah. And you cannot compare right, the maturity from one project with another, and this is one of the areas where Kate doesn't shine really. But it's getting mm. way better, and there are a few solutions we can see, right? And a lot of tools are probably going to yeah. get developed. Yeah, and the Vault, and the Vault um, has an amazing integration with all yeah. kinds of different cloud backends and um, literally to the point of if you were going to uh, detonate a nuclear uh, device, I think Vault has the ability to kind of, you know, free people in the room having a different <laughs> key and it's that yeah. secure, it's that level of... Um, yeah, it feels like of, uh, yeah, yeah, literally, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, um, well, one area I guess um, uh, Kubernetes doesn't help you very much really um, is the actual application um, level security really. Um, so Kubernetes helps you, um, you know, secure the cluster itself, what, what a cluster admin can do or what an individual kind of service or a pod or resource or something can do. But uh, as far as the application itself is concerned, um, I think things, uh, there's some help, um, but things are generally, I think, a little bit more up to you. So I talked a little bit earlier about what you can do with an ingress. So uh, just to recap, so an, uh, an ingress is like a um, like almost like a reverse proxy that sits in front of your services, and and you can do a lot of different configuration there on how that traffic's handled. And one of the things you, that you could totally do is um, uh, set up some authentication there. So when your um, request comes in, you might let's say based on the URL, for example, you might say, okay. Well, I know this is for um, this application. I'm expecting a user um, who has this particular grant or something, or has a role, has, has an authority. So you could definitely um, put that uh, logic in, in an ingress controller. I'm not sure how, I know that the Nginx ingress has some um, support for authentication. I'm not sure 
how what level that is yet, but that's definitely something that's in the realms of, of the possible. And I know from customers that I've spoken to uh, in the past, some um, ma fairly major people are really actually quite interested in this idea that um, you know you don't necessarily need to um, build uh, security for every single microservice. You have something like an ingress that um, sits there and has this responsibility of just a de you know a delegated um, sort of security and actually you know going off and um, uh, actually going off and do, doing that um, sort of uh, that, that kind of freeway or whatever it is, you know, that, uh, maybe it's a, uh, an exchange of some sort. Um, but for me, I guess the, it feels like that you're going to have to put a lot of knowledge into that ingress. And quite often in security, stuff I've worked on, that the uh, parts, it's, sometimes it's the application that knows um, um, what, um, you know, what, what role someone is. It has kind of meaning at a kind of domain level, I suppose. So um, that's can be um, sort of difficult to do. So I know that there are a number of um, sort of OAuth um, and OIDC, so OpenID ConnectFlow um, services that are available in Kubernetes. Um, so if you want uh, to go down the path of setting up um, an OAuth flow or an OIDC flow for your application, that could be a really good way to go. So I know that um, I haven't used it myself, but I know that um, to, um, Hydra and Dex both um, kind of support some really um, kind of what we call like Kubernetes native um, sort of installation. So they kind of exist uh, in a way that is, um, works really well, they coexist really well with the cluster and it's really easy to sort of provision, um, provision them within a Kubernetes cluster. So, uh, but in this kind of scenario, I think you still got quite a lot of um, configuration yourself to do. So if you're managing your own authorization server, you're gonna probably have other things that you're gonna need to think about that might be importing uh, users from your sort of LDAP store or your Active Directory. Configuring encryption, I mean, just, just actually saying it out loud kind of makes me kind of give me the shivers a bit, but it's mm. not something I <laughs> personally want to get involved with. It's just fought with danger and fought with um, things that you could get a lot of trouble for, I imagine, if it goes wrong. So um, I think if you can, I would personally be looking at um, using a kind of a cloud provided um, sort of authentication service, really, as an um, authorization server, um, especially if you're already using something like that. If you're using, say, like Okta or something at work already, if you've already got this kind of source for um, kind of what, who a user is, then I think, um, um, and also there's things like uh, all the cloud providers now have got this kind of notion of um, you know, providing a, a user-based authorization service. So if you can interact with that, I think that's going to be um, like a really good um, way of doing it. Um, so I haven't really said, so Istio is, um, so what that is, is a, a service mesh, okay? So um, I didn't want to go into huge amounts of detail about service mesh, but um, what it is, is really um, like um, something that sits alongside your applications and it's called a sidecar. Um, so the sidecar container basically will, if you ever come across aspect oriented programming before, it's like a separation of concerns. So you're basically saying, okay, um, things that are cross-cutting um, that the, your, the sidecar helped me for, and that could be like logging, um, and then that could be um, for security in this case. And what you have is a set of other services that can, like, a part of the service mesh. So in this case, you might have, um, oh, can pod A communicate to pod B? Okay, I, from the pod A and pod B, all they really need to do is actually um, send a request to pod B, but what's happening behind the scenes is the service mesh is actually going and saying, okay, I'm taking, I'm going to intercept your um, request. You're not going to know about it. I'm actually going to go off and check, do you have the um, policy to go and talk to that other pod? And if no, it's just you know, you know, 500 returns. So it's completely transparent. And actually, I think for internal security, um, I think service mesh is a really great way of um, doing it potentially. Although the cost is increased complexity, right? Because you've got now, all of a sudden, you've got this... Um, Another you get another layer of abstraction, you get another layer of um, things to understand. So I think um, it's a trade-off. But once you get to, let's say you're in a big organization and you've got a huge uh, cluster, I think at some point you're gonna be looking at service mesh to not just security, but for other reasons. So, um. okay, excuse me a sec. So within the um, Kubernetes cluster itself, um, there's all kinds of ways you can actually um, kind of enforce security and lock things down. I think the first thing you're going to come across as a user is, um, you know, I'm a developer, I'm an operator, I need the kubectl client, I need to do stuff with Kubernetes. So 
in, in Kubernetes terms, you're a user. That's who you are. Um, and the way you generally kind of get that author authorization is that you um, kind of go to the cluster and you kind of say, you know, give me some credentials. You authenticate yourself using um, some other, you know, it could be a username and password, or in many cases, it um, backs off to the kind of cloud provider's own authentication service. I know, um, so I use Google Cloud quite a lot, and in that, you kind of say, um, you know, G Cloud cluster get credentials, and then that automatically, that will just go off and um, sort of download a token. Um, and what you end up with is this, um, in your home directory, you get like a um, .cube slash config file, and that's got your kind of, um, where you're all for, for all the clusters that you've ever logged on to and you know about, it's got like a context, and that um, gives the information um, that you need to um, sort of log in. So yeah, and you can switch among them, right? So you, for example, have a context for kind locally. You can be switching between yeah. your local cluster and the development cluster, yeah. or no, the production, hopefully not, yeah. but you can be switching context in between. Yeah, there's actually a tool that's worth um, installing called um, uh, there's Cube NS you can install, and there's another one called Cube CTX, and it's just a CLI tool that makes actually switching um, between these sort of clusters really quite um, easy. So, so that's the first step, right? You can access the uh, Cube CTL, you can access the cluster, you can start doing stuff, and by default, I think most people they'll install Kubernetes, and you're probably just going to be an admin. You can you can do it, do anything you want, but um, that's gonna not gonna roll in <laughs> roll. You see what I did there, but um, it's not gonna <laughs> roll with many organisations. Um, so you're gonna really quickly you're gonna have to start thinking about um, sort of role-based access control. So um, and it's really really very similar to all the other systems out there really that implement um, role-based access control. So really you kind of see so the main two actors to understand as a user we just talked about on a service account is a process. Um, to you, typically that's going to um, be a pod of some kind. Um, what you do is that you kind of describe um, a binding that declares, okay, this person, this user, or this um, service account, they can do a verb, get, create, delete, update, and they can do that against a resource. Um, typically, say, for example, I've got in the sort of box below there, like sort of John can um, create or re um, read a pod, and he can do that um, in a namespace of prod. Um, similar thing for um, with the, the actual service itself. So you might, and the, the real big one here that um, you, know, you really do need to set up is when you're using secrets. So you're really going to want to be saying things like, okay, well, this deployment, it can um, only read this secret, but it can't read you know, other secrets. So you want to always make sure that you're um, sort of um, locking it down um, as much as possible. So, I mean, the, and these rules will basically let you um, kind of do that to quite a um, sort of sophisticated degree. Um, and the other thing is, we talked already a bit about namespaces, but they're just really a logical way of grouping these objects. And, and another way you can use um, sort of say, okay, f uh, objects in this namespace, they have, you know, uh, an uh, uh, they can talk to each other, or they can, it's a way of just dividing up that security. Okay, so um, moving on now into, I guess, really day two, called day two operations, really, how, um, you know, we, we, we've done our deploy, we've um, got things nice and locked down, so how do we kind of keep things uh, working op optimally? And yeah, so now it's when we have to be, to know, you know, we know how to push our apps, uh, we have to be prepared for when the error actually occurs, right? Because we're going we're gonna to be showing a few tools and stacks that are going to help us with it, and the first thing, we need to learn how to do is how to get the logs from one pod, right? So yes, do that. You can tell them. The problem is you usually don't have just one pod, right? You know, you have you're scaling up to five or up to one hundred. What are the chances of you hitting the actual instance? So for that, and also you can do some selection with K logs, but that wouldn't tell them. And for that, there is a nice tool that I like. I mean, there are many, but the one I use the most is called Stern because not only tails everything, it also color codes them, so you can actually see the output in a really nice way, and this helps a lot. I think for me, the other key thing here is that before that last example, I'll just go back, we're actually um, dealing directly with a pod, which, you know, it's, um, it's, you don't want to deal with pods, right, you, um, generally, because they're just completely ephemeral and things, so and it's, a, it's a pain to kind of, and they could change at any time, so um, yeah, this kind of stern, I think, kale is another one that I've, I've used mm -hmm. as well. So yeah. There's, um, yeah. Yeah. A tool for each one. Yeah. So yeah, all that was cool, but real life is like we are not gonna be streaming the logs on our laptop all the time, right? So you need to have that hosted somewhere. You are using one of the three, you know, one cloud provider, like for example, you know, Google has this amazing stack driver. 
So you have all that already figured out for you. But in case you aren't using any cloud provider, you want to do that yourself, uh, we're going to show you how to do this locally for testing. So the most used tag is called the EFC stack. And it stands for the name of the three fr uh, projects, Elasticsearch, FluentD, and Kibana. So the first one is a search engine. Uh, FluentD sends the log messages to Elasticsearch, and Kibana is a data visualization tool. So this is the most used one, but we don't want to give any advice on how to manage it in production. We are just going to show you how to do this locally for testing, locally, right? So never production. Mm -hmm. So inside the Kubernetes repo, uh, they have all the files you need, right? So you just go there, apply them, and a few minutes later, just a few minutes later, you have everything up and running. Uh, you, there are a few more details. I'm, I can't remember. I don't think there was anything else you have to do, but there are more, there's a more detailed guide in the repos uh, we showed up first, so you want to learn more about that. This is where you could go. And just by Pali, then we pour forward, because locally, obviously, and we just say, OK, this is my new Kubana, right? So we can just uh, create the index, and you will see your familiar tool with you. So be aware that if you restart the container, all the logs uh, are going to get lost. Because this is just you know for local development, just for testing purposes, right? So there are a few there are you know talks and conferences on how to manage these type of services, yeah. and we don't want to give any advice. On some, that, some right? of the cloud providers already kind of have. Um, I know I, I think um, Open OpenShift has something similar, uh, uh, kind of out the box. It has a Kibana, I think, and also um, the you know, Google um, GKE provides. Um, like they talked about the Stack Driver integration. I think the other thing as well, though, there's also already hosted services, or even in your own organization, there might already be um, like a, an EFK, an F stack, or something that you could um, sort of use. So I think that's totally, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the only um, tricky thing to be aware of is um, how you kind of configure the Fluent D for um, e e each pod, and that's um, exactly where something like um, like a sidecar container is um, a really useful, if your app, if you don't want to go kind of make sure all your different apps have got um, sort of a way of talking Fluent D, then yeah. Yeah, but that's one of the most common patterns to using the site cars is for you, you to tell, hey, pod, please also talk to this login system mm -hmm. or talk to this metric system or Istio is another yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. But this is why it makes sense to have more than one mm -hmm. container inside a pod only yeah. when you're going to apply those patterns, right? Yeah. And it's also worth saying that sidecar, you hear it a lot, it doesn't always mean service mesh. So a sidecar is just a pattern, so you can create your own sidecar, so it's no problem at all. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Cool. So, you know, logs are cool, but they're just recording from events. But that's usually not enough, right? Uh, if we want to really understand our system. So especially we want to have alerting on them, right? For that, we will use metrics, which represent the data that combine from meshing into this event. Uh, some metrics are like throughput, success, and error rate, and so on. And for that, we're going to introduce some two of the most popular tools on this space. And there are Prometheus, which is a system for monitoring alerting uh, with a very flexible query language among other things that I really like and use a lot, actually. And then you have Grafana, which is the most common visualization tool on top of uh, Prometheus. So uh, it comes out as well, so you're using Grafana, it comes with uh, some Spring Boot dashboards out of, I mean, that you can just import. So there's a massive community page where you can import different dashboards, and there is one for Spring Boot already. So you are enabling your metrics to go there. You will automatically see that. Uh, to install this, you want to test this locally, you can just use Helm, which is a package manager um, you know, it comes already with uh, Prometheus and Grafana to install it. So again, this is just for testing, not for actual production. But, you know, so we can just now pull forward and just by applying that, I mean, installing the Helm chat, and we will see our Grafana tool. But this is just going to show the cluster metrics, not our apps metrics. Uh, for that, we need to do a couple of more things, right? So we need to tell the apps that you, I want to expose metrics so that uh, Prometheus understand them. And Spring has a project called a Micrometer with a Prometheus registry that we can add to the project. I mean, you can read way more. You can specify your own metrics, and there are many things you can do. Um, but also, the one thing you cannot forget about is adding the Prometheus to the to expose it as an actuator endpoint, and just by adding the dependency and as exposure. You try that out, you see how you are now sending Prometheus uh, metrics, right? So this is something that Prometheus is going to scrap and it's going to understand by default. Right? But this is sadly not all. Now there are different ways, because now we have to tell Prometheus that we want to read from each app, right? And how do we do that? So depending on how you have Prometheus configured, you have two ways. Well, actually, yeah, you have different ways, right? You have the sidecar pattern that we have been mentioning mm -hmm. before. And you can just annotate your pod. And this is now, things are moving toward this model, where you just annotate your pod and say, hey, I want you to scrap me into this path, into this port. And automatically, Prometheus will use sidecar and say, OK, I know who you are. And it will go, okay, Prometheus now, I know that it has to come to this place. But if you're not 
applying that pattern or not, you can always manually uh, add the scrapping rule into Prometheus. And this is what it looks like, right? I think um, the good thing now is that where before you might have only the um, spring annotations for me to face, now they're kind of enriched really with these cluster metrics, right? So you might be seeing like, um, oh, I thought this was an app problem before, but all of a sudden actually you can sort of start um, kind of drawing conclusions about maybe other bits and pieces of your environment that you mm -hmm. wouldn't necessarily have such visibility of. Of before, so. Yeah, and especially the dashboard that you can see with Grafana, they're already there, so you can just see all the memory spikes and everything, everything will be out of the box for yeah. each other. And everyone loves graphs, right? I mean, yeah, yeah that's the so thing. What's not you know. to like? So. Okay. <laughs> already. And, you know, uh, also visualizing apps is good, but sometimes we want to also visualize what you have in your cluster, right? It's a really nice thing to have, especially if it's as easy as it is with Octant. So it is a tool for developers to understand how applications run on Kate's cluster, and it doesn't install anything, really. So you install it locally, and you have to annotate. A lot of the visualizations that have sealed, they, need, they require annotations as well for you to be able to display, but this one doesn't do anything. It's just, you know, you install it locally, and you can see you know, with a single command, Octant, you can see the following. So it gives you a really nice uh, overview of all the projects we have in our cluster. Uh, you can see, like, you know, the pods, the config maps, and you can go as detailed as going inside the pod and checking out the logs for a specific pod, right? So you can see all the objects, right? And you, can, yeah, you can see that well. So you can see all the workloads and all the different, uh, you know, config and storage. You can see everything from there, right? And one thing I really found useful is that you can graphically see the dependencies, right, that we have in our um, workloads. So also color codes then, so that if there's any problem with one of them, it will change the color, right? Something goes wrong, it goes to yellow, I think, and then red. And um, yeah, it's also worth mentioning that the Spring Boot team is taking a look into these tools so that we can provide better integrations uh, so we can add more info like actuator endpoints and so on. So this uh, tool provides something called plugins that's very easy to extend. And we're looking into how can we make this experience even better using Spring Boot over here. Yeah. There's also, I think by default in Kubernetes, you do get this dashboard. Um, that I think this is definitely, um, and you can install that actually, really, really, it's just like a manifest and it's maintained by the com community. But what I really like about um, Oxen is that um, you don't need to worry about um, having to expose kind of security of your cluster because it's all local. It's exactly the same security. It's just using your this cube config file mm -hmm. that, um, that you're using locally. So yeah, so the permissions um, you have locally yeah, are yeah, the permissions exactly. you're going to see, right? So there's exactly. no security. So the whole can of worms has really been, um, yeah, kind of mm -hmm. sewn up there. I think, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, because telling things in the cluster, like it can get super tricky, right? And yeah. you can grab more access than you want to, especially because you can see secrets, right? Mm -hmm. Here you will only see them. You have access to them, right? So mm -hmm. this is local, and you don't install anything. Yeah, so really cool we, uh, we haven't covered it in detail, but um, if you do look into service mesh, you kind of get another layer of um, visualization on top of this as well. So you could even see uh, even probably even uh, more um, kind of uh, interesting communication network traffic level on um, how things are um, uh, kind of actually communicating with each other. So. So um, we're kind of moving on to our, our, our last topic now. So um, if there's any questions at all kind of about what we've um, sort of covered so far, please um, feel free to. So, OK, um, when I was thinking about, um, you know, what's the kind of principle, fundamental um, design, uh, design principles behind um, Kubernetes, I kind of um, really thought of uh, what Yoda would do if he was uh, trying to uh, learn Kubernetes, and I definitely think um, you know, the first thing he would do would be um, understanding what the developers um, were thinking uh, when they um, built Kubernetes, and you know why they made the design choices uh, that they did. So I think, um, and also to actually uh, um, kind of see, understand why um, kind of things like. Um, uh, configured in such a way and why, why, why you have to do things in a certain way in Kubernetes, have it, having an appreciation of um, the kind of uh, design choices it really kind of helps, I think, um, for it to cement in your mind. Um, and I personally had a Eureka moment um, when I kind of uh, studied in a little bit more depth what the API server was doing and how it um, worked. And that for me, it felt a little bit like when, when we first sort of learned about polymorphism or something in object-oriented programming. It's like, oh, yeah, OK, I understand now. This is why, I'm, why it's sort of doing what it is. OK, okay so... Um, we, we talked so we went over a little bit um, earlier on sort of Kubernetes architecture, and um, one of the things I sort of mentioned was um, this control this notion of a control plane and and I think this is actually 
if there's one thing to sort of take away about um, the, why, the, why Kubernetes, in my opinion, has sort of been successful, um, it's really, I think, because they've come up with this way um, of building a declarative API. Um, and for me, that's, there's two sort of big takeaways from that. Um, one is that it lets you kind of scale really quite well because um, what's happening, the way it works, is that um, you make a request to the API and it doesn't um, just go off and imperatively kind of um, do something. What happens? It's going to record your intent and in, um, it's going to persist that um, using this um, storage engine called etcd. Um, and completely sort of separate to that, what you've got is a sort of set of components. And they've got these things called controllers and the controllers will be um, sitting there and they're just watching the things um, that they're interested in. Um, and, in. And the term we kind of use for this is called a reconciliation loop. So what will happen is that they'll see that um, the, someone has kind of made a request for a certain state to be true in Kubernetes. I might have said, okay, I want you to create me a pod with three replicas, please. Um, so the controller that kind of cares about that will be, will see that um, has been persisted and will go off and uh, make that um, make that so. So it will go off and create the pods or whatever, whatever needs to happen, right? Um, so what that means is that um, you can get lots of people collaborate, collaborating together as well. So it means that um, we can have different teams all working on different um, components and they can all, because they're all kind of working to the same pattern, no one's kind of able to kind of go off and do things in a, in a, in a sort of a, a different way. So it means that, um, the, the, it, it's the collaboration aspect is really important, I think. So you can have a very, very big project and divide up in a very nice way and there's these principles that you can um, sort, of, sort of stick to. And of course, because um, this is completely uh, asynchronous now, it means that you're less likely to have a bottleneck component and less likely to kind of have something that's actually going to um, cause the rest of your components to um, sort of be blocked by them. Um, another big thing for me is um, sort of meeting the user where they are. And I think the way to understand this really is uh, it's like inversion of control. So um, you, instead of that kind of, instead of actually creating a dependency yourself, you're getting it injected into your sort of running container. And really it's really quite similar in Kubernetes, right? So you've got your um, application and it doesn't need to have any special knowledge. It doesn't need to know, oh, this is a secret. It doesn't need to know, oh, um, this is a, a kind of a special DNS kind of thing I've got to do. It's all just presented to the app in a, in a, a really native um, kind of way. So um, I think, the, what this means that it just make for developers it means you don't have to um, kind of go to um, special lengths to want to make sure your um, app runs in the cloud. Um, and I think this um, principle uh, means that you can um, quite easily take a legacy kind of uh, workload and um, get it up and running. So, uh, so um, as we're kind of getting into more and more, so I think. Um, I don't know how many of you would be interested in kind of go down the path of extending Kubernetes, but I think it's actually quite interesting to understand a little bit about the um, Kubernetes um, extensibility, because we've already talked about this pattern with the kind of um, uh, the control plane and the API server and how that lends itself um, really quite well to um, extensibility. So what that means is that you can um, create something called a custom resource definition. And this probably is a term, a CRD. So this is a term that you probably will come across. So if you're um, using some kind of third party um, tooling within Kubernetes, they're quite often packaged as a, a CRD. Um, what a CRD is, it's a, a new type in the system. So it's a new type that gets registered with this um, control plane. and as, long, as well as providing this custom type, you can provide a controller that will um, watch for this type and it will do something. So let's say um, I create my new type, um, the controller might go off and um, you know, go off to GitHub or to do something um, external to that. So um, it can even be in your own organization if you had um, a quite a big um, Kubernetes deployment, you might um, think about um, building your own sort of CRDs to kind of capture sort of maybe some sort of domain specific information that you might want to um, sort of configure in a way that's very reusable. So you might um, create your own kind in Kubernetes. It's not that hard to do either. It's, um, there's so many tools out there and usually um, it means learning a little bit of Golang, which is the, generally the most popular um, language in Kubernetes, but there's nothing to stop you doing it in other languages. You can totally put a... Yeah, I think there's a talk coming this yeah. week as well mm. on how to build operators using Java. So yeah. It's very yeah. interesting in extending that. Yeah. You should definitely yeah. check that out. Um, I think the other um, term you hear some, from time to time is something called um, API machinery. Um, and this just really describes the um, kind of the entire pathway really between uh, client and server from the sort of the types, the kind of persistence, um, the, the kind of operations, of the control plane as a kind of a aggregated thing that's known as um, API machinery. Um, and the other bit that's 
interesting and can be quite useful. There's something called admission webhooks. So if you build um, like a custom piece of functionality, what you can say, you can register that with the uh, API server and you can say, okay, if you get a request of this type, actually go through all the security stuff, go through uh, the authorization, then just pass it on to me, pass it onto this webhook, um, and that can be used to validate. Um, so you, let's say we go back to our example, we created our own custom type, you might want to validate that config, we might want to say, okay, well, this needs to be capitalized or it needs to be numbers only, or you could actually mutate data, so you could say, okay, create a special kind of pod or something and actually you know, add some properties onto it so um, it, it's really quite um, flexible and not that hard to sort of sort of do really and that's I think this is one of the reasons another one of the reasons why the community has jumped on board so much with Kubernetes as a whole because um, especially for like kind of system integrators and um, service providers because it sort of allowed them to sort of package up their um, sort of software in quite a uh, quite a decent way um, that maybe wasn't as easy before and they had to worry about all different cloud platforms and this kind of thing yeah and some closing notes really so uh, we don't really know what the future may look like because we have seen that it's a very manual experience and we have to get a lot of knowledge and we need to know a lot of things in order to put something into production. Um, you know, it, there are a few initiatives over here and over there that are you know, making some noise. So maybe CNAV, right? So you have a, cloud, uh, you know, uh, what was the definition? It's so a cloud native application yeah. bundle, right? Yeah, so yeah. I think... Um, that's so, quite, a, quite a good one, really. So the, the yeah. thing is you create one bundle once, and that can be deployed into any platform. So that could be one of the ways. Or maybe with uh, Cloud Native build packs, you know, that's the thing we have been using Cloud Foundry for many years, and it's extending quite a lot now. And you just basically say, hey, this is my code. Put it into production. I don't care how. And looks like there are so many things happening under the hoods, right? So you can now even uh, apply a layer of the image only and do that in runtime. So yeah. it's getting really, really interesting as a project. Yeah. And then you have Canadian, right? So it may become more a platform as a service thingy than a function as a service thingy, right? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, definitely the uh, cloud native build packs, that's a really quite an interesting area. I mean, and at first glance, if you look at it, it looks quite similar to JIB, but where things get um, really quite interesting is, um, especially in like a production environment, what you're able to do is um, say, okay, I've got my um, image here, which consists of the layers that we talked about. Um, and then I can automatically, let's say I want to update the OS libraries because there's been a patch and you can do that. You can basically rebase that very, very quickly without having to do like a, um, an entire rebuild of your image. Um, and also there's facilities there to um, not even have to do that um, as a command line or part of your build tool. So you actually have like one of these CRDs that we just talked about. There's one for cloud native build packs and that will um, be just sitting there just um, purely f um, for building your, um, uh, building your images and actually kind of um, being able to do things like we said, you know, being able to make sure the uh, patches are kept up to date without a full rebuild, without this big um, slower kind of, kind of, kind of process. Um, um, I think the other thing uh, I think is really, really interesting though, I mean, we talked, I mean, how many slides do we have about deploying to Kubernetes? Like loads. So this is the area that, again, I think is really um, going to become more and more um, simple. And I think the movement that I'm certainly seeing is moving this sort of stuff to the server side. So there's already a movement in um, a feature in Kubernetes, I think 1.16 called server side apply, which um, is giving you more sort of validation of um, your manifest and thing, but on top of that, that you're um, kind of getting a, a number of um, serverless platforms. Um, so Google Cloud Run is um, one of the sort of main ones that you can use today. Um, that's built on top of this Knative project, and and really, I guess the big selling point is. Um, being able to take just you know your source code um, and not having to worry about um, you know learning so much about uh, Kubernetes deployment and kind of trusting that this um, you know service is going to um, do things in an opinionated way but that, that's um, tunable um, but basically make that um, a lot easier for you and you can use that today that's available. Mm -hmm. um, I mean the other thing that I, I think is really interesting is Project Riff which is another one that's um, sort of. Uh, similar kind of goals really so a serverless kind of computing platform as well as functions as a service so as a, um, you're being able to again take your app and being able to um, deploy that in a, in a way that's um, kind of uh, has some really sensible design choices made for you so, so you, you you don't have it and the way riff um, um, sort of certainly works is that you've you know you've got like a CLI component that you can use to sort of do a deployment of your app and then that you, you, there's a lot less of this um, yeah, just opinionated in a way that makes sense yeah. for a lot of the serverless workloads right that's yeah. Yeah. 
think the, the key thing is finding a middle ground between being able to configure things enough, but also having enough sensible defaults that um, works sort of well enough for the for that for the average user, really. Um, yeah, that's uh, the key. Yeah, so if it, if it, a little bit um, sort of uh, uh, under timed a little bit, but um, hopefully there, there'll be some sort of questions from, from people if there's anything we want, or even if there's anything we want to kind of go over a little bit again in some more detail. Um, we're yeah. like. Really happy to. And we're going to be around all the week, so yeah. let us know if you yeah. need to grab us. The, the other thing I did want to say, though, is um, as a kind of a call to action, really, um, if as sort of developers, um, if there's anything you feel that um, could be better with the Kubernetes experience, you know, do you collaborate? And the community is really, really open to collaboration and really um, receptive to new people. And uh, not just, and it doesn't mean you have to be a GoLang developer. And we're, we're doing a lot of work now on making the Java experience mm -hmm. better on Kubernetes. So I think that there's, the area is ripe for um, improvement. And yeah. yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you.